Go. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us on our webinar today. Um, we're very pleased uh, that you could make it uh, and share, and that we can share with you some thought leadership uh, on Microsoft Teams in health and life sciences. So the companies that are involved today, obviously Microsoft and their team's expertise. We've got Pexip who bring us lots of cloud solutions that allow us to, uh, to get onto the team's platform through, through other devices and platforms. And um, ourselves, Kinley, where I'm from, uh, and we're system integrators that will help pull that whole experience together. Um, the event is actually specifically brought to you by the Microsoft Healthcare and Life Sciences Group. Now, these guys uh, are going to repost this at uh, the link that you can see there. So we will be resharing it to everybody that is uh, joining the webinar for us. A little bit of basic housekeeping just before we get started. We understand it's a, it's a fair amount of time and some people may be dropping in and dropping out but uh, we encourage all our attendees to ask questions, so please ask. The questions are moderated, uh, and this will not show to the general audience unless the moderator shares and publishes the questions out of the Q&A panel. Uh, as always, we love to know, we get a wide diversity of people on these webinars, so we love to know where you're from. Uh, and if you would like, send us a shout out. It would be great to hear from you at any time. Uh, with your first name and which state or even which country that you're viewing from as well. At the conclusion of the session, the webcast recording will be posted to the Microsoft Healthcare and Life Sciences blog uh, at the following link, https slash slash aka.ms slash his blog, along with any resources mentioned during the webcast. Now, a quick overview of how you engage with the Q&A. You'll see on your control panel, you've got the two small boxes, one with a question in, obviously for question and answer. If you go to click on that, you can then input your question. And our moderator, uh, we're being ably assisted by Samantha Brown. She will be moderating in the background and also producing for us today. She will be able to uh, publish and moderate those questions. So our agenda, as I say, it's a it's a it's a full full feature packed show. So starting off now, uh, we begin with a, a keynote, and the keynote is brought to us by Kathleen McGraw uh, at uh, Microsoft. We'll come to the next slide where I introduce the speakers. Um, so yeah, Kathleen McGraw is doing the keynote, and that's from 12 to 12:30. At 12:30, Andrew Reuter takes care from Pexit. And he will be talking about uh, connecting legacy video systems to Teams. Then at one o'clock, I'm having a, a brief chat with you about how Kinley, as, a, as an integrated partner, can help get that strategy deployed for you. So how do you get to Teams using Pexit, bringing the whole show together? And then uh, we're very lucky to have Frank, uh, Frank Buchholz on board. And Frank is the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Microsoft and he's going to be showing us the 85 inch Surface Hub, which I know a lot of people are, are very keen to see and, and learn a lot more about. Certainly a lot of our clients are asking questions. Once uh, Frank's finished his piece, we get, we're, we're very, very happy to be joined by uh, our customer panel, which is uh, Mr. Anthony Kay from Beckton Dickinson. And also we have got our friends from MVP Healthcare, Jeremiah Brown and David Switz. Who are, and all three, all, both of those companies are clients of all three of us. So they can tell us a great story about how they've adopted, what some of their pain points are. And uh, finally, we're going to wrap up with any of the Q&A that, that was in the session that's starting to come up. So without further ado, I believe, we'll move on to the presentation. And I'd like to introduce Kathleen McGraw, who is the Chief Nursing Information Officer and Industry Executive at Microsoft. Kathleen, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be covering uh, Microsoft Teams in healthcare today. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to start and kind of set how healthcare is currently in transition. So there's two sets of discrete but interrelated forces that are driving change and disruption in healthcare right now. 
I think we're all aware of COVID-19 and some of the disruption and challenges that are occurring. Um, in the short term, healthcare organizations are being squeezed. They have plummeting income and they're climbing COVID-19 expenses. They're having a significant amount of canceling of profitable elective procedures. Um, and also many hospitals are also seeing the cost rise due to overtime, contract ver workers and agency workers, and the high prices for supplies. As we know, COVID-19 has, you know, there's this enormous supply chain that's now being utilized. Um, also, hospital and health systems are bracing themselves for system-wide disruption by announcing temporary layoffs, reassignments, and pay cuts. So there's a lot of disruption here for our healthcare providers. With narrow margins to start and small amounts of cash on hand, many hospitals are going to fail or will seek a partner for M&A to survive because they have depleted reserves and their days of cash on hand are quickly dwindling. And our healthcare organizations leaders really are now looking at beginning to shift with managing the crisis. So they're keeping their organizations functioning and continuing to man manage this transition back to a restored future. So that means that they need to plan mid to long-term economic and scenario planning to understand the related impacts around operations, employees, financing, and supply chains. Also, there's an attitude shift from a primarily reactive mode to anticipating how to reinvent the organization for a successful future. And then apart from COVID, at the same time, there are long-term systemic issues that healthcare organizations must address. So just as digital transformation in other industries has led to increased patient expectations, patients have higher expectations than ever towards their doctors, their insurers, and the treatments they receive. Essentially, 81% of patients are unsatisfied with their current healthcare experience. There's pressure in security and compliance in order to keep healthcare data secure. Health organizations really must prioritize security and compliance, especially with the threats of ongoing high-profile data breaches and identity theft. Currently, the global industry loses about $6.2 billion per year to data breaches, which puts patients at risk and strain already very tight budgets. 41% of providers say they have challenges with data and analytics to accurately estimate costs, and it's, present, it's preventing them from succeeding in value-based care models. And we know there's a global shortage in healthcare workers. Um, as populations age and health needs become more complex, providers are facing a global shortage of workers at the worst possible time. And by 2030, providers will su suffer from a projected shortage of, for shortage of 14 million workers worldwide. And I think I'm hearing anecdotally from the organizations that I'm working with, specifically around their nurses and their physician providers, COVID has been such a stressful event for them and it's been a sustained event. They're losing many of their providers already, even though we're not at that time where they might be retiring, but they're making other, um, other actions they're taking they're stepping back away from the bedside because of covid so next slide please so microsoft really empowers healthcare organizations to achieve more by bringing our technology and our solutions together into experiences that unlock value for our customers so essentially we're moving from systems of record we realize that most organizations have some type of electronic health record already implemented to making them systems of insight and through to systems of engagement. So moving to this new patient paradigm also changes the way clinicians work. So they require health IT systems that can evolve and support the new paradigm that they're working in. Um, with over 25 years of serving healthcare organizations, our expertise is deep and our imagination is boundless. We look at insight and systems of engagement and improving collaboration and communication because it's critical component to successfully delivering proactive healthcare wellness in a new patient paradigm. Next slide, please. Microsoft Teams is a team, is a hub for teamwork, a chat-based workspace that enables teams to be more productive by giving them a single and secure location that brings together everything a team needs chats, meetings, calls, files, and tools. Microsoft Teams is the one place for all the needs that your team will have. And we deliver on four core promises to create a digital workspace for high performing teams. So first, Microsoft Teams solves for communication needs of a diverse workforce. Since its preview, Microsoft Teams has evolved to include a complete meeting experience as well as chat, voice, and video. And you can use Teams for informal one-to-one -one or group chats. You can utilize your mobile phone if you're on the go, or you can have an open conversation in a channel, and this enables people to share information in a transparent way to accelerate decision-making. 
It's super easy to move from a chat into a face-to-face -face meeting, helping you to bridge geographical barriers. When it comes to collaboration, the deep office integration enables today's multi-generational workforce to use the office apps they are familiar with and love, such as Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, and others, right with the context of Teams. Teams is unique in how we enable collaboration. Today, when you want somebody's feedback, you send them the file via email, they store it locally with comments, and you store it again. So it's kind of that cycle of back and forth with different, you know, draft one, draft two, or version one, version two. So you have to kind of jump between email and other apps, but Teams allows you to bring all the Office 365 services together so that you can easily share and co-author files without the need for email attachments. And we know co-authoring co and collaboration is tremendously helpful. Many of you use other services that Office 365 as well, which results in you having to jump between and spend time in disparate experiences. So we built Teams to not only be the hub for Office 365 services, but for all the services and tools used on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can customize Teams with tabs, connector and bots to include the apps and services that you need. You can also utilize relevant third-party apps like GitHub and Trello, and they can be included in Teams. So we have integrations with over 150 partners. And for our development team, we have also created an extensible platform to enable building apps and to integrate with business processes. So Microsoft Teams comes with the enterprise grade security, compliance, and manageability that you expect from the Office 365, which our customers tell us is a huge value add for them. Next slide, please. Microsoft empowers healthcare organizations to achieve more by bringing our technology and our products together into experiences that unlock value for our customers. And our value position is anchored in multiple things. So we can go ahead and build the slide out, please. For trust, we never compete with you or monetize your data. At Microsoft, we are focused on trust and we are always empowering, never competing with our healthcare customers or partners. And most importantly, we are not monetizing your data or your patient's data. And then for scale, industry leading, leading cloud scale infrastructure and partner ecosystems. So on top of all that, we have the industry leading scale with over $15 billion invested in cloud infrastructure and more than 1 million physical servers across 54 global regions. Only cloud provider that has a, uh, that has a mature partner program. So we actually have the largest partner ecosystem in the market with more than 68,000 partners. And as you can imagine, many of them are health partners. And more than that, on top of our cloud competitors combined, our partners are equipped and designed to work with healthcare organizations of all sizes. And then our highest levels of commitment are for security and compliance and meeting the industry compliance, especially specific with healthcare and their standards and certifications. These are actually committed with $1 billion invested annually in security and our Cyber Defense Operations Center, which brings together security response experts from across the company to help protect, detect, and respond 24 by 7 to security threats and in real time. So it's the most comprehensive set of compliance offerings for any cloud service provider. We have more, cer cer more certifications than anyone in the market and the key concerns for healthcare organizations around the world. So we really aim to complete all of those certifications so that we can understand what's going on within the healthcare and regulatory environment within healthcare. Next slide, please. So when it comes to virtual health, there's really no shortage of terminologies that are used. Um, underneath of the actual definition, you can see there's a word cloud on when you're looking for telehealth and all the multiple disparate ways you can describe it. So for the purposes of this discussion, um, we're gonna use the definition to encapsulate the wide variety of technologies and services that are on the market today. So virtual health, it connects clinicians, patients, families, care providers, and health professionals to provide health services, promote professional collaboration, support self-management, and coordinate care across the care continuum. Prior to COVID-19, movement to virtual health was a slow, steady progress forward. We had to overcome many obstacles, such as payment barriers, especially in reimbursement models by private and government payers, medical licensure standards, crossing barriers across state lines, and patient and physician preference, and then need for in-person exams. Over the past few years, 
Um, we do have companies that we work with like Teladoc and MD Live that have forged ahead with new business models and platforms that were of high interest to employers and some payer organizations. And certainly digital first consumers are driving more interest and consumption of virtual health. However, COVID-19 has changed the virtual health landscape. The US federal government has temporarily relaxed many of the regulatory barriers and enhanced the ability to get reimbursement. Providers have had to act quickly to protect patients and clinicians from COVID-19 exposure and yet maintain normal operations. As such, the utilization of virtual health has skyrocketed. Microsoft expects to see healthcare organizations continue to leverage newly implemented virtual health technology tools throughout the current recovery period and into the new normal. And while no one can predict exactly what comes next, it is hard to disagree with Seema, with Seema Verma's comment that considering the CMS will likely lead the effort to permanent changes, it's a reasonable assumption that virtual health has entered a new era. So next slide, please. So we have really looking for better care with Microsoft Teams. Next slide, please. Health organizations want a more connected, data-driven and seamless virtual health experience for both patients and clinicians. Teams offers the technology that can meet these needs, including recording and transcription, so we can have meeting recordings and transcriptions that you can actually search. The patient experience, which is a simple one-click join in a Chrome or Edge or a mobile join browser. Physician scheduling, including virtual visits app, which is in preview, and then specific use cases around home care, remote monitoring of patients that are in and outpatient, remote specialist consultations, rural care, military or other um, organizations, and then mental health virtual consults. Next slide, please. Access to the extended patient care team from any device at any time, including IM and presence, sharing documents, voice and video calls, and then telehealth around provider training, administrative meetings, and continuing medical education. So we really built teams to enable intelligent meetings. So you can have more effective real-time conversations and more intelligent meeting times. Next slide, please. We have AI power capabilities in Teams today, such as inline message translation, which allows you to translate messages in channels and chat in almost 40 language, languages. With a simple click, people with spe speech, people who speak different languages can fluidly communicate with one another, ensuring that every worker in the team has a voice and facilitated global collaboration. We have meeting and recording transcriptions that are powered by stream, which enables all team members to easily catch up on missed meetings. As you can read the transcription, search within the conversation and play back all or a part of the meeting. And with the mobile companion mode, Teams picks, picks up as if you are in a meeting room or suggests that you can use your phone as a companion device. So you can, for example, advance slides from within your phone. With background blur, participants can blur their background during a video call to ensure professional meetings on the go or avoid possible disturbances in the background, like a dog running around in the room, which actually has happened to me multiple times since I've been working remote. Or you could have a background of your choice. So I actually have a background that I selected um, from photo within my gallery. Clinical and operational analytics solutions make it easier to gather and use the massive amounts of information available in healthcare to improve virtual health processes and outcomes. Clinical analytics solutions focus on the use of data and analytics to improve clinical treatment processes and outcomes. And in virtual health, analytics can support clinician assessments by predicting a patient's barriers to care via social determinants of health or for digital triaging activity, such as the Microsoft Healthcare Bot, which is very helpful. It can help risk stratify patients to recommend the right level of care needed and the next steps or handoff. Operational analytics solutions focus on the use of the data and the analytics to improve the efficiency or effectiveness of systems used to provide and manage care processes. Again, in virtual health scenarios, they can, these can support no-show predictions as well as program management capabilities such as staffing and cost management. Next slide, please. Healthcare organizations do not want to deploy, support, and train clinical users on multiple methods and clients to support audio and video chat or virtual health sessions. Microsoft Teams enables a wide variety of virtual visit capabilities and clinical collaboration. So we're better together, Teams coupled with cost-efficient, 
ultra portable Microsoft Surface devices. It allows health organizations to develop a secure, high impact patient communication system. So we have accessibility through virtual care. We have integrated Microsoft services for virtual care into your patient facing apps, and we provide interactive portal access for patients on desktops and a mobile app, as well as we can bring your care provider closer to your patient for improved outcomes. Next slide, please. We have high quality video with no plugin installs for patients, which makes it seamless for the patient provider or the patient um, to their family. Next slide, please. We like to keep providers safe from infection and reduce use of personal protective equipment. Um, so there's multiple uses for virtual rounding using Teams. So you can have your team essentially gather together. One person only needs to enter the room and the rest of the team can be virtual. This decreases the use of PPE. It, it, the devices in the patient's room can be locked into ongoing individual Teams meetings so that they're always able to connect to their provider team. The team's non-meeting features are disabled for the room device, including chat and recording, and providers are members of a team for each building or location where they work, and they can access through links and join ongoing meetings of patients' rooms. So you always have accessibility to your provider or your multidisciplinary team. Next slide, please. The patient and family connect allows patients in isolations to communicate with loved ones and reduces patient and family anxiety related to patient conditions. This is very specifically brought out in the times of COVID because we realized that many of our patients were not allowed to see their family and they had no access to their family. So this allowed the one to many communication via Microsoft Teams. They are given a unique ID and a unique email address and they have the ability to have multiple communications and they can directly contact their family and their friends. Next slide, please. So in responding to the challenge of COVID-19, we really look at both internal at the employer and the employee and the contractor and then external looking at public, public and patient facing um, public and patient facing solutions. And we really were looking for the safety of the community that's paramount around our employees, our patients and our customers. We understand that excellent cannot be compromised and that the science and the evidence and the pragmatism really should inform our decisions. We need to remain flexible and innovative in the face of a rapidly evolving cir circumstance. We need to be inclusive and equitable and it's really responsible of the organization to maintain the health of their employees and to be fiscally stable. So we actually looked at different options around the ability via teams and meetings so that we can enable virtual work and collaborate from anywhere. We have the company communicator. We have the ability to do crisis management so we can able to inform our customers. They can inform their employees. And then we have the ability to look at inbound requests and schedule consults with our patients. Next slide, please. So yeah. our external inbound engagement actually helps patients navigate through a symptom checker for COVID-19. You can see to the right there is the actual chat bot. It reduces the number of incoming calls regarding COVID-19. There can be an escalation point, and I'm going to walk through that in a second, and then we can redirect to bookings or book appointment. We heard from a significant number of our customers, especially when they become a hot spot and they have this huge influx of patients, that they just could not manage the, the demand that the patients that were calling or emailing. And there was a wide variety of how our customers were dealing with the COVID um, request. Having the ability to have a chat bot that can screen the symptoms and can actually essentially identify patients that are at highest risk for COVID, allowed the opportunity to do better care. And it could also allow opportunity to take care of what we call the worried well, which originally was about 35% of the patients that were contacting these organizations so that they could actually have some point to where they need to go as far as learning more about COVID. Next slide, please. So the team's integration with the health bot was really designed to enable the healthcare partners and customers to easily create intelligent, compliant healthcare virtual assistants and chatbots. And there's multiple use cases you can use for triaging patients via symptom checker. You can help patients find care. You can look up nearby doctors. You can check your claim status, or you could ask questions about benefits. It's completely customizable. You can tailor the bot to the unique scenario and integrate it within your own third-party endpoints. And there's an out-of-the-box baseline functionality that's fully configurable. Um, also, in the next slide, you can see that we can actually direct patient to an actual meeting and they have the ability to do it, to join an 
online meeting that can become a virtual visit. So if you have a patient that say is at high risk for COVID, you do have the opportunity to actually do a virtual with them, virtual visit with them, or have them schedule an appointment for a virtual visit. So you can do a actual provider screening of that patient specifically. And then on the next slide is our company communicator, which helps in sending broadcast messages to all employees. It helps keep our employee, it keep your employees informed. It also avoid, helps to avoid panic. So your employees really know what is going on and have some semblance of you know what they might need to do. You can send them messages on how they need to do their specific health check and their health and wellness checks and other things. Um, and then for the crisis communicator, it's a one-stop shop for all the company information, news, forms, integrations. It can help secure employee safety status and can help inform employees of safety practices or alerts in a centralized manner. So why is Microsoft really looking at virtual health? We are a platform company. We provide end-to-end -end technologies that Microsoft and our partners use to build solutions that are not only powerful, but also digital first, integrated, manageable, and cost effective. And we're uniquely positioned to do this. No other company has the comprehensive breadth of the platforms and technology. No other platform company has a larger ecosystem of partners. And no other platform company has more experience or expertise in building trustworthy software and operations that meet compliance standards. For virtual health, Microsoft enables five important platform capabilities that allow customers to create the virtual health solution that best fit their clinical, business, and IT needs. And they are a digital front door, virtual visits and clinician collaboration, clinical and operational analytics, remote patient monitoring, and a unified data platform. So during this extraordinary time, our responsibility has been to ensure that tools we provide are up to the task of supporting our customers in their time of need. COVID-19, both the pandemic and the necessary response created a new set of operational and clinical challenges for the healthcare industries to which healthcare providers have had to pivot and adjust very quickly. This crisis, crisis clearly indicated that need for connected views of patients connecting the care teams and connecting to secure health data. We know that technology has a role to play in accelerating progress for solutions to the pandemic and other pressing healthcare concerns. The Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare will make it easier for them to focus on what you need to do best, which is delivering better experience, insights, and care to your patients and your providers. Thank you. Kathleen, thank you. That was really good. Very informative, and uh, I think it's put a lot of meat on the bones of uh, what teams can bring to the healthcare sector. Uh, so next up, we've got Andrew Reiter. He is Senior Director of Business Development at Pexit. And uh, Andrew's going to uh, talk to us about how we connect our legacy video systems with Microsoft Teams. So Andrew, welcome. Thank you very much, Charlie, and thanks, Kathleen. That I agree. That was a wonderful wealth of information. That's fantastic. Um, as I mentioned, Andrew Ryder, my email address is there. Please contact me afterwards, post questions during the session. Um, and as mentioned, I'm going to cover sort of, you know, existing environments and working uh, with teams. So I've, I've kind of broke this into three bits. I have a little intro on sort of who Pexip is in case folks don't know who we are. Quite, not quite the brand as Microsoft, but um, working clearly with Microsoft. I'll talk a bit about the what and the why in terms of what we're doing. Microsoft is a real sort of natural partner for us. Um, the trust uh, that Kathleen mentioned and the focus on security is absolutely core to what we do. We'll talk about that. And I'll talk a little bit about the experience um, that we provide in terms of what it means to working with teams. So in terms of PEXIP, um, it's pronounced PEXIP. Um, there's not much of a story behind the name. I get asked, what does it mean? It doesn't mean a lot, it's a name, but what means something is the brackets uh, in the logo there. And that's really fundamental to sort of who we are. We connect a variety of different and disparate environments and what we're focused on and connecting is sort of real-time video, mission critical communications, and making sure people have a better way to interact and meet. So if we can go on to the next slide, we'll put some context to this. Um, we've been around since 2011, uh, you know, a long pedigree in video, in secure video, video conferencing, all of this. So well before the, the COVID uh, pandemic hit. And one story I'd like to share on that is we actually um, IPO'd recently um, in, in May and we're on the Oslo Stock Exchange. If you look for us, uh, that's not so relevant. What's relevant is how we did this. So we started this process well before COVID. 
And anyone familiar with an IPO, this tends to be sort of the, you know, the money people conversation. There's a ton of meetings with various investors. It's a bit of a power thing, right? The people with the money want to sort of look you in the eye, shake your hand, make sure they know who they're investing in, let you see their sort of, you know, Crystal Palace, that type of thing. So it tends to be very much an old school in person, have that dialogue type of thing. So we had started this process and then COVID hit and it was like, hey, we just put the whole thing on hold because of the way these investor roadshows and things work. And we said, well, no, I mean, we clearly make tools and we want to help people see that we make provide tools to communicate and collaborate much more effectively. So we said, we're going to go forward with this. But it's actually quite enlightening and transformative for a lot of the investment community that we worked with on this process. And we did everything virtual, extremely unique for an IPO. Um, and again, had this success. And this was sort of early days of COVID, right? In March, everything locks down. We start doing all these virtual roadshows. So it was fairly a new paradigm for a lot of the investment community to recognize, hey, this is the future, right? As things are being locked down, this is the way to communicate. So it opened a lot of eyes and really sort of drives the point of what we do. Which, thank you, no, great transition. <laughs> um, which is, this is the new world, right? Anybody that's been doing sort of the video side of this, the real-time video for years now is always, you know, this is, you know, video is now, um, but it is now. Um, if we can sort of build out the rest of that um, slide, we've moved from this world of, you know, hello, are you there? To, you know, hello, I'm here. Let's interact and let's engage and let's engage in a much more effective way than we have in the past, right? Instead of having our blocks on the calendar we have to fill the whole hour because we're on this audio call where we're not able to sort of really get the richness of the communication we can be have shorter meetings but much more effective meetings and as kathleen mentioned right i mean this is everybody's a sort of a video if we can just go back everybody's a video expert um, today uh, my mom is a video expert now right my grandma is a video expert now which is absolutely fantastic right for your yoga class or what have you, but also for COVID, just connectivity. Not everybody when shelter in place was at home with your sort of family, lots of single people, whatnot, right? Sense of isolation. So just the nature of video and ensuring um, uh, an emotional and connection with other people. But what's really important in terms of what we do together with Microsoft um, is um, our focus in the market is on sort of uh, providing trust for your data. We don't monetize data just like Microsoft. Again, natural partner. I think most folks have heard the expression, right? If you don't know what the product is, uh, you're the product, right? And there's a lot of wonderful tools out there that provide a lot of great capabilities. But are those the tools to use in healthcare, in life sciences, given the regulatory and compliance needs, right? When we talk to customers asking, you know, what's your most valuable asset? It's their people. Right, invariably they say it's the people and why is it the people in the organization, right? The people have the knowledge, they know what's going on, right? They're collaborating, they're communicating internally with colleagues, externally with patients, etc. And what are they communicating about, right? It's intellectual property, it's sort of the next product, it's the next vaccine, right? It's patient um, healthcare information. This is something organizations need to ask themselves. Do they want this running over a platform that maybe people are holding yoga classes on and have a very different business model where they're potentially maybe not putting ads in a meeting, but potentially sort of monetizing that data and selling it to different organization? What's being talked about? So that's not our business model. We focus on a trust. We do not monetize data. We focus on security and we focus on these high quality communications. So if we can go to the next slide. So great, thank you, you know, so what, who cares? What does that mean for Microsoft Teams? And this is sort of fundamentally what we'll do. And there's sort of three key elements um, to this. First off, there is an existing world of video conferencing technology out there. And to Kathleen's point, right, organizations are looking at how they sort of maximize the value and the investments that they have, right? People are under financial strain at the moment with everything that's going on. So there's this established world of existing video equipment. We fundamentally connect that into Microsoft Teams. And when I talk about Teams, I'm meaning Teams on, you know, on your PC, on your desktop, Teams on Surface Hub, if you will, Teams in a Microsoft Teams room. These two worlds sort of speak a different language, if you will. There's a different sort of technology behind it from when these things started, but what we do, right, the brackets around PexTip, we fundamentally connect these worlds together. So that's number one, existing world of video conferencing. We connect that together with Microsoft Teams and vice versa. Second, there's a large world of, you know, why do I have Skype for Business on this slide? There is a large world of Skype for Business out there that is moving to Microsoft Teams. And I'll, I'll use a customer example. We have a customer, 400,000 users. 
um, they're moving to Skype for Business on premise and they are moving to Teams. And they had this sort of multi year plan for that. Um, they had PECSIP for enabling Skype for Business to work with their existing video conferencing rooms. What they did is because we can connect Skype for Business with their existing devices, but also connect their Skype for Business to Microsoft Teams in a real time audio video call, they are able to actually accelerate their move to Microsoft Teams. So we connect those worlds as well. Again, the brackets around PECSIP connecting different things. And then the third element is the cloud. Right, we talk about the cloud, but the cloud is the clouds. Right? There are multiple clouds out there. Teams is in a cloud. Um, Kathleen talked about the Azure and Azure sort of this, uh, this cloud underlying a lot of what Kathleen talked about. Um, and PECSIP provides a service in our cloud. But when we started creating this solution back in 2011, uh, fortunately we had some technical folks that were fairly smart and recognized where, where some of this was going and realize the world is going to be a multi-cloud world and how do we connect some of these different clouds and more importantly how do we sort of enable our customers on where they are in their cloud journey and what cloud means for them and i'll explain that a bit more as we move forward so if we sort of go to the next slide so this is the world of video conferencing. I just went you know, online, grabbed some different pictures of things that are out there, but these are existing video conferencing rooms. And why this is important is uh, this is, you know, if you look at these, some of these different sites, there's a fair amount of money that's been invested on installing these. There's millions of these devices out there. There's literally billions of dollars invested on building these types of conference rooms. You know, there are boardrooms, for example, you know, somebody has got the, Teak from the deck of the Titanic in their boardroom, for example, right? That's not something that's going to change overnight. There's a large investment. This is the question is how do I get this to work with teams? And we're able to connect that. One of the questions that comes up these days, though, is hey, it's COVID. Nobody's in the office. So does this environment even matter? And I say, yes, that's right. right? It's sort of yes, nobody's sort of in the office, but yes, it matters. And why it matters, again, I'll sort of stress that point Kathleen made is, is investment. Everybody's figuring out their remote, remote work policy, right? And this is sort of on the administrative side of sort of health and life sciences, right? The clinical side we'll talk about in just a minute. Trying to figure out what's that real estate strategy. Work has changed fundamentally without a doubt with this pandemic, but the office is not going away. Organizations are looking at what do they do with their office space? And they're not gonna fundamentally just rip and replace all this. They're gonna make it work with teams, but they're gonna figure out, hey, how do I potentially add more teams rooms into this? And why would I do that, right? There's been an explosion in sort of pre-COVID in what was known as the huddle room. Organizations built these open landscapes, they put in huddle rooms, um, so you had smaller lands, smaller environments as well as conference rooms, as well as boardrooms have existing video kit. And why that's interesting as people are coming back into the office is I won't have 12 people in that sort of top center conference room at the same time anymore. I may have three in there. Where are the rest of them? They're working remotely and they're brought in on video and able to connect. Right, the huddle room, I'm working in the open landscape because I, maybe I did have to go into the office for some reason, but I can go into the huddle room, potentially take off my mask, assuming I have the proper air flow and all of that, and have a dialogue with somebody remotely. So organizations are looking at how are they managing their real estate? How are they maximizing their existing investments? And how are they managing that transition and change that's fundamentally altering how they work? And the last bit I'll leave you on with this point is um, what we've seen with uh, customers leveraging our interoperability capabilities for these conference rooms into Microsoft Teams, we've actually seen about a 5x increase post-COVID of using these spaces. And why that's significant is, right, not everybody's back in the office, and we've seen this more sort of the uptake in Europe, right? They've gone back to the office first, but people haven't gone back in mass. They've gone back just a few. But what they're doing is just mentioned, right? They're leveraging these assets that they have to be able to connect with all of the remote workers um, that are so distributed out throughout their organization. So they're seeing a lot more value, frankly, out of these environments. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, but this sort of installed base isn't only in the conference room. There is a large installed base in the sort of clinical environment. Again, these are just uh, images off uh, the internet. And by the way, PECSIP doesn't make any of these devices. These are third party systems that we help connect into uh, Microsoft Teams. And so there's a whole variety of specialized medical equipment out there. And again, organizations are looking at how they leverage these investments to be able to connect into their uh, Microsoft Teams environment. Um, couple examples on, on this as well. 
uh, you know, Kathleen mentioned, and she sort of covered a lot of this, um, is in terms of uh, safety for patients uh, and providers during COVID, right? Being able to use video as that connective glue. Um, we saw typically this space with around these metal carts tended to be, um, uh, you know, organizations that were like uh, IDNs or what have you, large geographic areas, Alaska healthcare providers, you know, central US where you had a large geographies to cover. And they often had these carts in their clinics and they were able to connect patients back to the doctor sort of in the central hospital. And they're sort of been doing this for years. And now what we've found with COVID is right, six feet has effectively come a massive geographical barrier. And so organizations, right, these sort of people have had expertise in sort of remote care, are really bringing that into their urban centers and helping organizations understand how do you sort of treat, you know, meet with somebody beforehand over video, should they come in or not, right? When they're in the environment, right, they're in the ICU, as Kathleen mentioned, outfitting the ICU so they'd be able to, people can talk with, with uh, their family, et cetera, or minimizing the amount of PPE needed. Key point here is lots of equipment is out there. We, we allow organizations to leverage this equipment as they migrate and move to teams. They can leverage it with these teams and they can start augmenting those environments as well with a lot of the cool technology that Kathleen mentioned, as well as Frank's gonna come on and show us later. So we go to the next slide. And then so the third bit that we do in terms of um, PECSIP and really this sort of again, the brackets and connecting things because a lot of organizations have, right, they've built their portal and their web page for their patient access, right? We all log in online to sort of schedule that next appointment. We have our, you know, our records, our healthcare records there that we see as patients. And a lot of our sort of customers, sorry about that. A lot of our customers have sort of looked at, hey, I have this portal. I want to enable that portal so I can bring my patients in over video um, to their uh, provider. And what they've done on the back end administratively, they have teams everywhere. They're using teams between the doctors and nurses, et cetera. And they wanted to enable that portal. Um, and so the PECSIP allows for them to sort of bring video into their existing portal, leverage those existing assets, right? Everything is branded um, with their, um, their organization's brand. It's nothing with PECSIP there, which is really important, right? To establish that trust. And they're able to bring those um, sort of patients uh, and connect them together with the providers uh, who are using Teams within the organization. So protecting that workflow and driving some of these new workflows, which have been really critical in this time of COVID. If we go to the next slide, there's just some examples of uh, some representative customers of ours. We have a large uh, US uh, federal healthcare provider they sort of did exactly what we talked about in terms of being able to enable their portal and bring video um, right out to their end patients. And they went from 2,500 sort of patient encounters a day to 30,000 uh, patient encounters a day. A big piece of this is really the mental health side of things. People feeling isolated, being able to connect video is just such an awesome medium to be able to go and have those encounters in a safe way over video, but just massive growth, right? Sort of pre-COVID and post-COVID in this really dramatically changing world where this is how we're going to engage going forward, All right? We got used to it in the yoga class or the social hour, right? This is how we'll do it uh, in the medical arena as well. Um, similarly, you see some other interesting metrics there, right? 60X growth in 100 days and the 1400% growth. So um, just video uh, as a medium in the healthcare arena, right? Clearly a, an important use case for everybody's uh, safety and well-being. So how does this work? Um, what does this look like? Uh, let's go ahead and go to the, the next slide. Um, fundamentally, it's this. It's a native experience, and this is really a, a key point. And I'm going to I'm showing sort of an administrative example here. I have sort of a typical video conferencing device on the left there from one of the providers out there, and I have sort of the team's experience, if you will, on the right. The key thing is whether it's those conference room that I showed you earlier, those medical carts that I showed you, right? People that are using those that equipment are familiar with that experience that that equipment provides. Similarly, right, everybody's getting used to Teams. We're all using it at home now with this working remote. People are familiar with that experience. What we do, and the, the brackets around PECSIP, we connect these environments, but we preserve those native end user experience so that this isn't a complete retraining exercise to be able to bring these worlds together and get more value out of these assets. So let me take you through a little example on that. So if we go through the next slide. The way this works oops, um, is effectively, so step one, you go to Outlook, and this can be in Teams and the calendaring side of things, but I'm just using sort of, you know, schedule, how do, how do you set up a Teams meeting? Um, I schedule that meeting, I go to Outlook, 
you know, budget review here. Uh, I got Dom Draper and Peggy Olson in there for those folks who are familiar with that program. But anyway, um, nothing to do with PEXIP, right? It's just Outlook and Exchange. I push the Teams meeting button, and what that does is sort of the step three here is it populates the meeting invite with the Teams join information. And that's the part at the top. And without the PEXIP integration, that's the bit that I get. I'd receive that invite and I could click that and join on that with Teams. The part that we do, right, no user intervention needed, is we populate that invite with a bit of additional information. So join with a video conferencing device. And now if I'm inviting this, sending this invite out to somebody else and they have a video device, they know what that means. They understand what that join with video conferencing device information means. They can use that video system that's in that room and join the meeting. Now, an important detail here is um, the address they dial, and again, people using video conference system understand this. It's, it's like an email address. We call it a URI, but it says teams at Contoso.com there. Maybe a better example would have been meetings at Contoso.com. What's a really unique thing that we do is we allow organizations to leverage effectively their domain or their identity. So let's say I'm Contoso.com and I've sent this invite out and Kathleen's going to call me and join. She's going to be dialing Contoso.com. She knows who she's connecting with, right? Preserving that brand and that identity of who she's connecting with, right? Absolutely important in terms of trust, in terms of knowing whose meeting you're actually joining. So very unique in terms of what we do, in terms of allowing organizations to leverage their own domain. If we go to the next slide, um, there's even easier ways to go ahead and join. Um, when I booked that meeting, I may have a certain conference room that I need to use or a certain cart that I need to use. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and book that room in the invite just like I normally would because I need to reserve the time with our integration on the back end. We recognize, hey, does that room have one of these legacy VTC systems? If it does, great. What we do is we populate this join button on there. We do this for Cisco and Poly devices that are in those rooms. And the date and time, you know, you walk into that room, you press the join button and it handles all of the dial details to be able to connect into that team's meeting. This is super important for ease of use, right? Works dynamically with that whole workflow. But the other piece is this is really key to sort of building that bridge to adding MTRs into an existing environment. So customers existing video conferencing equipment, users are familiar with this experience. This experience sort of transcends between these different uh, types of endpoint devices. So whether it's a Cisco or a Poly device, we provide this uh, one touch join capability as you add MTRs. Microsoft Teams room, Surface Hubs into those environments, they have that same sort of push the button when you walk into the room join paradigm. So really key to sort of bridge that gap. If we go to the next slide, um, back up one. Another unique thing that we do um, is in terms of how do we minimize friction with this join flow at the same time as preserving a very secure environment, right? That's uh, core to our legacy and our DNA here. Microsoft has a really fantastic sort of security model. Um, hopefully folks have set this up uh, appropriately, uh, but effectively it's a lobby. And every, you know, folks out there, I'm sure we've all heard of a certain other vendor in the industry who had a lot of challenges around sort of meeting bombing, if you will. What Microsoft done here is they've implemented a lobby, which is really fantastic. And the way this, this works in summary is if I'm part of the organization, I've been invited to the meeting, I bypass the lobby and I get into the meeting because I'm a trusted member of the organization. If I'm an external guest, I'll land in the lobby and from within the team's meeting, I can see who's in the lobby and I can admit them. What we do is we bring that to this existing world of VTC devices. We have some backend integration that we recognize which are the VTC devices from that actual organization. If they're from the organization, we have an authenticated connection. We trust them. We allow them straight into the meeting, reducing meeting friction, you know, join friction. External participants, they're going to dial in. They'll get in the lobby. In this example here, I'm showing Lars Bergendahl. He's in the lobby. On the VTC side of things, we display a message letting them know they're waiting in the lobby. And on the team side of things, it's the normal team's experience. You get the lobby pop up. I can go ahead and admit them or not, but absolutely core to preventing any of this meeting bombing type of thing, right? And you, you know, you heard about it with one and you don't hear about it with, with another. So a really unique experience. One other reason why this is really fundamental, again, particularly with folks who have those medical cards or existing room systems, they're looking at replacing all of their legacy infrastructure with Teams as the hub, as that meeting paradigm. And often they'll book a meeting with just sort of three of these existing video conference rooms. And people will walk into those rooms and they may not even open their laptop with Teams and they just connect with those devices. 
if you don't have this secure trust type of model, they'll all be sitting in the lobby waiting for someone to open that laptop, right? So this is really core to sort of allowing organizations to move off of the legacy VTC infrastructure, if you will, leverage those assets in the rooms, but have a very natural um, sort of meeting flow uh, and joint perspective. So building on that sort of security paradigm, there's another core thing that we do, and this is sort of talking about that sort of third element on the earlier slide about the cloud is we provide flexibility in terms of the deployment model that we offer. Now we offer a SaaS service, right? You know, Teams is a cloud SaaS service. We offer a SaaS service that provides the brackets, right? The connectivity between these existing carts, medical carts or VTC equipment um, together with Microsoft Teams. And that's, you know, fantastic, right? Easy from an IT perspective, easy from a consumption perspective, manage and maintenance. Now, um, and, and that's sort of kind of very common in most of sort of your collaboration tools out there. One thing that we've done that's fairly unique is we've allowed the ability to sort of take our software that we run in our cloud for organizations to go ahead and put in effectively what is their cloud, whether they've built their own data centers or more realistically, what we see most customers doing, putting it in their Azure tenant. All right, and this is really critical for organizations that need to have absolute control over their data, uh, control over the media flows, control over what geographies and what data centers um, some of that um, their information is actually stored in GDPR. Forgot to mention we're a Norwegian company, hence the Oslo Exchange, right? GDPR is core to us, core to us. You know, recently the EU Court of Justice had a ruling on Privacy Shield, right? That's no longer valid. So being able to control, you know, where your data is running is absolutely key. And what we see customers who have, you know, these types of requirements is they're able to take our platform, run it in Microsoft Azure. They're able to define exactly what data centers that's going to run in, and they're in complete control of that environment. Um, and so that's really been sort of a key thing, particularly in governments, uh, really large financials as well as healthcare, who so have more stringent sort of data and privacy policy requirements. This is just sort of building on that theme. Um, so if we go back, if whether you're sort of consuming the service from PECSIP, um, we have a global footprint, 14 different data centers across the globe. We will take traffic as soon as it hits, hits us and backhaul that across our network for, right, for quality. Uh, similarly, you know, Azure, fantastic, right? Massive global footprint. We give you that flexibility to deploy um, where you need to and how you need to. Regardless, either way, you have access to a global environment, whether you want to consume our SaaS option or our self-hosted option as we call it. And then so and finally in closing, um, really what we're about, again, we're about connecting, making sure you can protect the investment that you have in your journey to Teams and leverage more and more um, the Teams environment as you go. And it's not only about protecting investment, driving more ROI out of those assets as we figure out what does COVID mean? What does this new work landscape mean, right? Another unique thing is it's one platform, whether it's the administrative workflow or the clinical workflow, right, or Skype, if you will, being able to migrate to Teams, being able to leverage an existing portal, right, as being able to take advantage of more and more of the tools that Kathleen talked about, taking advantage of all of those different tools and functionality and being able to do it from one platform for all of those sort of real-time video needs and bring it into Teams is absolutely key. We modernize that IT uh, backend, as I mentioned, we make Teams the focus of that meetings hub, meetings environment. There's a lot of legacy sort of meetings environments out there customers are trying to move, up, move off of. We help them modernize that backend and make sure that Teams is that hub. And then sort of finally they're right, sort of Teams is the, is the core of that work environment for that real time interaction. So with that, thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, and I just one sort of last call out for me. Uh, thank you very much for our uh, Kathleen and Ali on this call and our partners and what we're working on, but also uh, Anthony, Jeremiah and David for coming on this call, right? What we're about at the end of the day is being able to, allowing people to connect and collaborate and share and what better way than to have our customer panelists share their experiences with you. And it's coming in a little bit. Ali's gonna come on next, but thank you very much for your time. Andrew, uh, thank you so much. Flawless as always from Pexip. Uh, you guys put on a great demo. Um, it's, it's a fantastic service that really does enable, enable us all to get to where we want to be with Teams. So thanks for that, Andrew. Super informative. So hi, everybody. Uh, you heard my dulcet tones a bit on this call. My name's Oliver Henderson, or most people call me Ollie Henderson. Uh, I'm the uh, Microsoft lead for Kinley US over here. 
so what is Kindly? Kindly is actually a global integrator and uh, we take all sorts of solutions from AV to unified collaborations, but more and more we're highly focused on the unified collaboration space. We've been doing this for around 10 years in UC specialization, about 20 years or so experience in AV overall, but really have set ourselves out as the trailblazers in, in the sector. Very recently, we've acquired a company called AVMI, uh, which makes us the largest AV integrator in Britain, uh, third largest in Europe, and about number five in the globe. So we can see some key numbers up here. I'm based out of our New Jersey office in the US, but globally, we've got around 1,200 employees with revenues up, actually just tipping over 300 million at the moment. As I was mentioning, 20 years experience, and uh, we have 90% customer rep retention, which is a really high number, and it's something that's very key to us. And we, you know, we've got to thank some, some of our great team players and project managers for that. A lot of our employees are actually 24 by 7, and that's because we've got several global help desks that are always on, and that enables us to deliver excellence in the customer care section. Moving on to the next slide, Sam. So we've got a lot of enterprise experience. We're very lucky that some of our key clients are Fortune 100 companies, heavily into the Fortune 500 and more so into the Fortune 1000. But what this allows us to do is have, have a whole enterprise approach to how we look after our customers. And that allows us to stay consistent with project managers, solutions architects, and also people like myself, who will help handhold the client with their strategy all the way through their global rollout. You know, it's very pointless doing something. It's very, uh, Siri's just joining in, sorry with the conversation. Um, it's important for us to, to say that if you roll something out in the US and then you carry on into the UK and then carry on, say, for example, into Asia, the experience has to be the same. And that's why we, we do have a lot of enterprise expertise at Kimmy. Next slide shows us some of our locations and deliveries. We've got over 20 office locations globally. Uh, here in the US, it's New Jersey and New York City as well, uh, down in Florida. But moving around the globe, we've got major operation centers in London, Norway, in Oslo, and we have our head office is in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. We've also got new key offices in Hong Kong and India, which have just come online. Here at our Cedar Knowles office, if we look to the next slide, uh, in New Jersey, we've got a customer experience center. Not a great time at the moment with COVID, but you know, you can always get in contact with myself or any of the Kinney team. You can come down and see a lot of the technologies that we're talking about today. We've got four different flavors of Teams rooms in action. We've got all PEXIP enablement throughout the office, so you can see how you can call from a legacy Cisco environment into your Teams environment. Everything we're talking about on the call today, we can demo for you in person, and we can actually also go as far as to send out some demo equipment and demo to you remotely as well. On to the next slide. Why is Teams exploding? There's, for me, there's three main drivers behind this economic, technology, and social environmental. Economically, clients are already paying for their 365 environment, and Teams is part of this. Why would, why would you start to spend more money on something that you already can take advantage of? Why would you go over the top on that? The client is also becoming much more aware and educated the high cost of these legacy solutions that Andrew's mentioned, uh, that were going back, say, for the previous five to 10 years. There's heavy maintenance, heavy renewal rates, and, and clients are just becoming a little tired of that. On the technology front, the quality of the products, you know, Microsoft have been very smart to push out the actual hardware product to some of the big vendors out there. So you've got companies like Crestron and Logitech are investing millions in these solutions, and they're coming out with some real cutting edge technology. Microsoft are also enabling exceptionally feature rich releases of Teams. We've got blurred background, real time transcription, integrated whiteboarding, and these are just a few of them. I know there's also translation as well. And with the final piece on the technology, which I thought was interesting, is that you've got people like Pexit making it so much easier to have multi environments. And we'll move on to multi environments because I, I really see this being a big part of, of the process. There's a social environmental thing, which has just become even more impacted by COVID. So you've got fear of missing out, which is actually a thing you'd be amazed. I'm, I'm speaking to CIOs and CTOs, and they're coming back 
to the office from COVID and, you know, they're like, oh, we use Teams. It was phenomenal when, when we were out of the office. We've never used it before. It was so seamless. It was so good. And they're looking to move to Teams because they don't want to be standing on legacy hardware. Huddle space is exploding. I mean, it's changing a bit. Don't get me wrong with COVID. There's definitely, definitely some key changes. You know, not as many people in huddle rooms, but huddle space is still exploding. Next slide, please. Slide, please, Sam. Yeah, yeah, and really quickly, Ollie, uh, we have a question coming in specifically about Kenley and if it has a state and local government team. A state, yes, we do have a state and local government team. And um, depending on which state we're on, the state register for a lot of states. I know it gets very complex and complicated as you move into particular states, but yes, I know New York, New Jersey, uh, and Pennsylvania. We're definitely on because I've been dealing with projects there recently. So we certainly do. Uh, and you can reach out to us on that one. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Early 2020, what was I seeing pre-COVID? Teams was absolutely flying. You know, there's no secret. Uh, according to Microsoft's financial year, Q1 results is 200 million monthly active users of Office 365. So if you take that as a standard, you know, how many, there's still a lot, we've still got a long way to go to convert all those monthly active users of Office 365 to Teams users. The active daily users in uh, September 2019 was 22 million. In February 2020, pre-COVID, that jumped to 34 million. And now post-COVID, it's 75 million active daily users. I say post-COVID, that's possibly wishful thinking. Um, Microsoft have now got 5,000 internal sellers globally focused on Teams growth, you know, so that the resource is there. We are all here to help you on your journey into Teams. Microsoft has got dedicated resource. Kinley's got dedicated resource. Pexip has dedicated resource. We can all see where you want to get to and we can all help you there. Gartner has predicted, and they're not often wrong, that Microsoft Teams will soon be as common as Outlook. And Microsoft have got a two year plan to regain market share that they may have lost a little to Zoom in the same way they did with Slack, starting with $75 million fund to place MTRs into their top 500 customers. MTRs and Microsoft Teams are um, a phrase that a lot of you will be very, very familiar with now. Microsoft do have a big focus around meeting rooms and they see team consumption growing three to five times when an MTR is reduced, uh, introduced. Next slide, please, Sam. COVID strikes, what happened? Obviously in March, COVID came along. We were, all, uh, we were all plunged into lockdown and everything changed as we knew it. Competitive platforms were blighted with security and VPN issues. We all saw uh, lots of bombings going on with, with a different competitive platform. And, and that's where I think Microsoft really set itself to one side of how secure it was. Also, I know from one of the big legacy platforms, performance issues were absolutely abysmal right at the beginning of COVID. And we've heard that from a lot of clients and that they have wanted to move to Teams for that reason. Teams is the uh, only end-to-end -end native platform. You know, everything else is a bolt-on. Everything else is an add-on. With Teams, you can go from your chat, I am chat, to, to sharing files, to manipulating files, to inherent calling and then you can have a video call and a meeting without leaving the platform you know it really is end to end and uh teams will put teams users reported a really simple work from home experience people could pick up the laptop disappear out of the office open it up get into teams and their workflow was uninterrupted uh what we did find was that there was a huge and accelerated adoption strategy due to covid and i think we've all got to capitalize on this next slide please sam what is Teams? Uh, you're all aware of that. You're all aware why they're on the call. But for me, the cornerstones of Teams and what makes it more powerful, and Sam, this is a four point slide as you're clicking through for me. You've got the one on one group chat, which we use heavily internally at Kinley, you know, lots and lots of different projects and meetings. Every client has its own uh, chat channel and every job has its own filing system from that. So, you know, we can chat on through that next. From that, Sam, we've got a powerful online meeting. So you'll often find a one-on-one -on -one group chat or, or, or a chat with multiple occupants you can then spawn a powerful online meeting. Following on from that, we have enterprise calling as well. And, and our clients can't believe how easy that is to integrate. You know, $12 a month for calling in these Microsoft Teams rooms. It's a really good feature. Uh, and then built-in 365 apps. Obviously, everyone's using Excel, PowerPoint today in our case, and we built all of this in our Teams channel. As a, as a collaboration tool. 
Next one, please, Sam. What's the workplace starting to look like, even in the here and now? You know, it's not so much post-COVID, but far less business travel. Everyone's very nervous to be out there, and we should all be doing our bit not to be traveling as much as possible. Social distancing will continue, both externally and inside the office. So huddle rooms, even though they're exploding, and, and, and you know, I'm getting a boatload of inquiries for more huddle rooms and more rapid deployments, they will have fewer occupants and work from home will become part of people's lives forever more in my point of view. Next slide, Sam. Thank you. So what are we seeing at Kinley? Uh, what are our clients, especially a lot of the healthcare clients? Client activity is high, it's good. Major corporations are planning for either their return or the next phase of working, how they're going to work, you know. Uh, a few people in the office, uh, as Andrew mentioned, people will still be using these uh, rooms they've invested in their office. I've got inquiries for major global rollouts, so it's new strategies we're adopting how to handle global rollouts of teams. Desire for agile and rapid purchasing with OPEX models. People's budgets have been blown to hell by COVID, you know, it's, it's not it's not great. Whatever was set in stone pre-COVID is gone for, for all of us. So we've got a, a lot of OPEX modeling, which will allow you to pay over three years. Teams migration is gaining more and more traction after COVID, and we're getting a lot of inquiries for a lot more usage and adoption strategies, for work from home teams. What can we do? What can Kinley do? So that was like a state of the market of where it's at, and what can Kinley do to help? So we've got new end-to-end -end progress. We've actually got a, a standard configurator portal, uh, which I can show you a little bit in here. Uh, and that allows you to build room standards. You know, if your organization is uh, on the continental US and, and coast to coast, you can have set room standards, what types of hardware, what types of screens, how we do that. So we can build those standards into a portal that you can use internally. We have a free pre-configuration portal. You know, we can't underestimate the importance of the pre-configuration and the pre-staging of a team's integration. We have to make sure your network environment is right. We have to make sure your team's administration is right, your 365 is correct and your exchange is correct. If these key elements aren't taken care of, then you're set up for failure. So we come in and we consult and we, get, we capture all of your information, we help and work alongside you, and then we get everything set up. Then moving on with rooms and a strategy if you're wanting um, if you're wanting uh, Microsoft Hubs, if you're wanting MTRs, it doesn't really matter either way because we've got everything set up. Uh, smart monitoring, we can actively smart monitor products and I'll talk about that a little bit. And then we obviously do the implementation, put everything into place for you and we can maintain these uh, systems with Microsoft service level agreements. I implemented a streamlined sales process, which is dedicated to teams. So it was new, new to Kinley, new to the industry. You know, we weren't, we all weren't doing MTRs at, uh, 12 to 18 months ago. So we've got a new internal process to deal with rapid rollouts. I'm starting to find quite a lot that a company will get in touch with us and um, and will help from the get go. I will help with their strategy, help talk them through their network requirements. I'll get the network team involved. Is there a cloud requirement? Is there interrupt? You know, we'll get PEXIP involved at that stage. So right at the head end of the process, all the appropriate people will be involved to guide you. Then it's a menu driven approach, usually sp split into huddle, small, medium or large rooms and what element is work from home. We can give you prices on all of those and we can build a scalable pricing model. Clearly defined scopes of works and we've got a lot of new technical skills, skill sets in house in the business which allows us to help you with your Microsoft environment setup. We can actually begin to assess your networks whilst the sale process is going on, so we can be ready to integrate and roll out as soon as you push the button. Pre-staging and updates. I'm not going to cover every point on this, but what you'll generally tend to find is, let's say you were looking at a rollout, which is pretty common for us of around 100 Teams rooms. You know, these products come into us and they've been, say, sat in warehouses for a short amount of time. And what's critical for your success is that everything's on the latest version. You know, are your hubs on the latest version? Are your MTRs on the latest version? We can update the Windows operating system. We can update BIOS as if need be. Connected peripherals get all the updates. So we're giving you the best keys to success from the get go. Then we are capturing all the credentials to take things on to servicing, monitoring and maintenance. 
and we set a, a really good quality of service at that point. So what this pre-staging and update replaces in traditional AV or traditional video systems, you have big racks of equipment. That's not so much a case anymore, yet you do have a lot of equipment and we like to bring this into the Kindy warehouse, whichever area of the world it may be, get our hands on it, make sure it's all watertight, ship shape, set up in your way with your logins and usernames on the equipment and we can just deploy them for you. So mass deployment for unlimited endpoints, providing we've got the network and the space. Standardization, I mentioned at the head of uh, the, 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 the discussion, I've got a Kindy Run Configurator. This is something we built in house. So you can have it your way with your standards throughout your organization. We can configure your room, we can select the additional services, and then we can give you a quote straight away and you can use that now or save that for later. So on to the next slide, Sam. You can see here's an example screenshot of the workflow of the configurator. What size room is it? This one's a huddle room. Do you want a video conference? Do you want dual screen or do you just want presentation only? And then which platform are you looking to use? Obviously, in our case, it would be Microsoft. We do do a uh, very detailed total cost of ownership and ROI analysis. You know, everyone's got financial people to answer to. So when you've got a, let's say, a large Cisco legacy environment there, these environments can be five, 10, $15 million globally. We can help you to sit down and formulate a strategy with some key tools that we've built to take into account what your total cost of ownership of your Cisco environment is and how much it's going to cost to get to your team's environment. What this allows us to demonstrate is, is rip and replace right at the head end the best way, or do we phase that in by keeping some Cisco equipment, adding an initial, say, 30, 40 teams runs, and then as the Cisco stuff becomes end of life, putting everything through the Pexit cloud, do we start to drop off the Cisco equipment and go 100% team runs? That's where we want to be at the end, is how do you get from the beginning of the process to the end of the process? And it gives you the metrics that you can report into your executives and your FTOs. We do rooms of service and OPEX. We do that in-house at Kindling. So we can roll everything into a monthly payment. You want to, let's say, have 50 rooms with a Pexit cloud, with extra teams licensing, with training and adoption, and you want the whole thing maintained and monitored. We can take the whole number and wrap it into one ball and then it's over three years. There's benefits to this. Obviously, there's no massive capital expenditure to begin with. It makes it much more manageable with monthly payments, so 36 monthly payments, and it removes a heavily depreciating asset of the balance sheet. But the key part for me with that is that it always allows you to have the latest equipment. We're in a fast moving world with fast moving environments. So if you took this as a three year OPEX model, at the end of three years, you can elect to just carry on paying your monthly payment and we can rip and replace the existing equipment and drop in the new equipment. Multi-platform environments, we're all gonna to have to get used to these. You know, it's not perfect and everyone wants to have a 100% slice of the pie themselves. It's probably not gonna happen, especially not in the near future. And that's where PEX is playing such a strong role in this. People have invested, you know, millions of dollars in some of these legacy environments with the best will in the world. They can't justify just ripping them out and deploying teams rooms ad nauseum. So what we're able to do is control and help and assist you with multi-platform environments. The message here is that having a multi-platform environment is no longer an obstacle for you using teams throughout your organization. We can get legacy Cisco and poly environments talking on a Teams platform every day as if they were native Teams devices. Smart monitoring and VNOC. I can also uh, actively smart monitor your Teams rooms. I can actively smart monitor your legacy environments, giving you updates, giving you dashboards, which allows you to see when devices are failing or devices are working. If a microphone becomes disconnected, and you were sat in your US office, you could see that something was offline, say, in your UK office. Uh, and more importantly, Kinley has got active monitoring on that. So quite often before you realize there's an alert or seen something come up on your dashboard, we can be in and fixing it. Next slide, please, Sam. So, so there's a brief overview uh, of the service and workflow automation. So you've got integrated AV rooms in your legacy environment or Microsoft Teams rooms, and then we have your network on the right hand side. So you can see we've got connector agents and collectors 
which take all the information and take the heartbeat and pulses of all of those pieces of equipment that are on your network. Through our management platform, through the cloud, which is ServiceNow, we are able to send you dashboards and you can see dashboards of what's going on. We also get SMS and email alerts of any equipment failing. And then the Kindy Service Center is straight away able to be contacted and we can remedy the issue. There's an example of a Teams room and, uh, and what, our, what our smart monitoring is looking at. All the time, pulses are being sent out. So 12 plus services in there. We can see the serial number and the power status, the camera status and mic status, which is always crucial, and the window service status, what, where, where the Teams registration is, what level of Teams it's at, the application and OS versions. So, you know, we get a really good grasp of what's going on in your Teams rooms all the time. And this is crucial for any global rollouts. It ensures that the room technology is always ready for a user and it sends proactive alerts to customers for any issues raised with an MTR device or in room peripherals. That's an example of the dashboard there. So it's a traffic light system and you can see green, amber and red. So in this environment, we can see there's uh, some rooms at the top that are working perfectly. You've got an amber alert there, which is a, a non-critical error. So maybe a process isn't working in the background, but the room's still fully functional. And usually red would indicate a very serious issue, such as a camera being unplugged or a monitor being down. And all of this smart monitoring plows into ServiceNow. ServiceNow is what we use as our back end and it allows us to do a ticket generating system. It allows you guys to be proactively kept in the loop at all time for any issues that may arise in your environment. The final point that I've got to mention on this is training and adoption. You know, Microsoft have got a lot of excellent training resources on their website and uh, Kinley also do a hell of a lot of training and adoption. It's the key to all success with your team's role. I can't underline this enough. If nobody knows what they're doing, then you know users will be going into team's rooms, they will be using service hubs, and they'll only be using five to 10% of the capability of the product. If we can get people trained, then their knowledge base increases and adoption becomes far accelerated. So my words of advice are use Kinley, use Pexip, use all the resource that Microsoft has, and we can help to train your users. Great usage and adoption in, invariably leads to, a true, leads to a truly successful rollout. On that note, there's just a, a final reminder that, that we are a truly global organization. We can deliver globally. Uh, it's our bread and butter. It's what we're set up to do, and it's how we can really help you with a lot of those headaches and a lot of those nightmares that people can be faced with delivering a team strategy across the entire globe. So any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them at the end. And, and also, if anyone wants to reach out, uh, I'll be sharing some contact details as well. And I think that's about everything I've had to say for Kinley. So thank you, Sam, for navigating and steering me through that very ably. Uh, we're gonna move on now to, to Frank. Uh, and Frank is a senior, senior product marketing manager uh, at Microsoft, and he is showing us the very exciting 85 inch Surface Hub 2. Frank, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. So hopefully everybody can hear me okay. And I'm here in my living room. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, present to you. Uh, I am, uh, I'm starting back in March, I was able to talk our Surface engineering team into letting me bring home one of these prototype uh, Surface Hub 85 inch devices. And so I'll give you a little bit of a uh, tour of that. Um, a quick introduction, um, Frank Buckholz, I'm on the Surface commercial marketing team. My focus is on Surface from a technical perspective, meaning that I focus on things like deployment, management and security. But I also have a little bit of heritage with this particular product line of Surface Hub. I used to work for a company called Perceptive Pixel, which Microsoft acquired about eight years ago, and then uh, actually used the IP of that product in order to build the Surface Hub um, line of products. We are now on our second line or second generation of Surface Hubs. Uh, we produced in the previous uh, line a 55 and an 84 inch Surface Hub, and they were key and, in and instrumental in the bringing collaboration into modern workspaces. 
Uh, we very much look to the new Surface Hub devices as being able to extend that range. And when we start talking about devices like the 50 inch devices, which I'm flanked by on my left and right, those devices are key to, to essentially turning any space into a collaborative workspace, meaning that because of the wheels and because of the ability to utilize the device in any way um, fashioned, you can in, essentially roll the device into a nursing station or into a stand up space or even into patients rooms and actually use the device um, in a key fashion. I'll actually demonstrate that the uh, 50 inch device actually comes integrated with a battery. Um, it's an optional um, accessory for the device, but we can actually add a battery to the device that allows you to roll the device from space to space. And I'll actually demonstrate that um, a little bit later. But let's go ahead and uh, dive in. And I, what I really want to show you is the current experience that the Surface Hub uh, gives. And then I'll uh, actually talk a little bit about the 85 inch after that and show you some of the um, kind of the new kind of capabilities that the Surface Hub will bring to life, especially the ability to use it in education um, for diagramming and diving into the human body or anatomy and other different pieces, or even doing patient record reviews and doing actual uh, um, you know reviews of x-rays and other pieces along that line. We see lots of different use cases for the Surface Hub, especially as a pen and touch device and then how can we utilize that in the healthcare um, and life sciences space. Uh, with that, I want to dive over and take a look at this uh, 50 inch device that I have over here. Now this device is the uh, this device we actually shipping right now, right? So this is our current 50 inch surface hub. It is in a three by two aspect ratio. It is a 4K display. Um, this beautiful device is uh, it's designed with a computer inside of it. So if you're not familiar with the Surface Hub product line, know that this is an all-in-one device. Um, it essentially allows us to walk up and use the device. And the reason that we're able to walk up and use the device is it's running Windows 10, but it's running a special version of Windows 10 we call the Windows 10 Team OS. Not to be confused with Teams, like in Microsoft, we love to confuse people by killing one word and adding S's to the end of it or not. And this is called the Team OS. And the reason that it's a special operating system, it is its purpose built so that I can walk up and use it. Uh, most operating systems um, require you to authenticate, especially in the enterprise or in a healthcare environment, you should authenticate to the operating system before you can use it. Meaning, how do I get to my own critical data and files and other pieces. And I'll show you how to do that, but one of the things that this device is keyed around is the idea that how do I use the device in a space where I could not have to authenticate to the device in order to use it. And so in that particular case, I can walk up to the device and actually join a meeting, um, a Teams meeting that is, and I do not get prompted for any passwords. And I'll show you actually doing that on the 85 in just a little bit. The other piece would be is I can actually whiteboard on this device and I can whiteboard by just tapping the uh, whiteboard button and being able to actually connect um, to the whiteboard by just drawing on it with a pen. There's no authentication needed. It's just like walking up to a, a whiteboard in your own uh, like office space. Maybe you have a classic you know, pen and uh, soft pen and whiteboard on there and you just take the cap off it and you start writing on the whiteboard. It's that simple to use. The other piece would be is how do I connect to the device? And in this particular case, I have below me a uh, device. In this case, it's a surface, um, it's a uh, surface uh, device. So I've actually connected, and I'll show you below that I have this device that is uh, that is down below on the uh, on the device. This is the new Surface Book Three, and this Surface Book Three is the new uh, powerful device. It's got 10th gen Intel processor. It's also got a Quadro um, processor from NVIDIA, meaning it's got a discrete GPU in it that provides great degrees of power. So if you're doing the types of analysis or bio, uh, biochem or other types of pieces, this is a great device for you to have. Now, what's interesting about the Surface Hub is I, in this case, have a single connection to the Surface Hub coming from that Book 3. The Book 3 allows me now to actually take over the screen, which it actually just did. So now when I actually interface with this uh, Surface Hub, it's actually coming in through that cable. So as soon as I hit that connect button, it actually looked what, for what was connected by a USB-C cable and actually presents it here. So I now have the ability to actually walk up and log into that Book 3 that's below me. 
Now, what's super cool is I'm running Photoshop on this Book 3, and I have full ink and pen interaction back to that device that is um, connected below. Now, the Surface Hub has its own computer system, so I could run applications on it, but maybe not something as powerful as Photoshop that requires a discrete GPU and the power and the memory and the processing power of that 10th gen Intel. So that gives me the flexibility to walk up and connect to a wire and be able to do this type of uh, functionality. But to show you that I'm truly connected, what I really wanna do is disconnect that device and show you some other cool feature. So I'm gonna disconnect from this device and I'm gonna pull up that book three and actually hold it in my hand here. And so now you see that I've disconnected from the device. Now, one of the other ways that I can connect rather than a wired connection is I can actually connect wirelessly. And so I could do a Windows K. K, I have no idea what K stands for, connect. I don't know, um, but here I hit the uh, Surface Hub that is uh, projecting or allowing a Miracast connection and in comes the device and I'm able to now project to that device over what's called Miracast. Now Miracast um, within Windows 10 is rather unique. It actually provides ink back and touchback over a wireless connection. So that means that I can still come to this device and actually manipulate this Photoshop piece just like I would if I was on the actual device here. And I can now do the same thing from both devices because they're sharing a common stream between them. That's super cool because you can imagine a physician could walk into a conference room, has a record review to do or some sort of patient review to do. All the records are on this secured book three, but they can project to another device. They could leave this device anywhere in the conference room and then being able to project to this device, being able to come up and manipulate and actually take notes and, and even have ink and pen um, in, um, interaction with this uh, device but all the data is actually kept on the book three. So you can imagine the value of that where other physicians could actually come up and say, no, I see a problem over here. Let me go ahead and ink over here. And then that would actually show up. It's much less intrusive than somebody grabbing your own book three and actually doing that. So now we have that interaction. So hopefully you can see the value because when I close this device and leave the meeting room, it stops connecting to the Surface Hub. And the value there is all the data is on this device and nothing is left on this device because this device never stored any of that data. It was just used as an interface or an extension to this book three. So hopefully you find some value in that and some use cases that this could be used where having a device like this and being able to project to it, maybe you even walk in and there's something like this in a patient room and being able to project to it, but even being able to have ink and touch, there's multiple value cases or use cases that we could show. All right, I'm going to put this device down and show you something else that I think is super cool. Um, within this world of Office 365, what we're often doing is we're often wanting to get to our own content. But in this case, maybe the content that I walk into the meeting room is stored in the cloud. How do I get to it? How do I easily walk up to a Surface Hub and be able to get to my own content that is part of Office 365, my Word, PowerPoint, and Excel files? Well, that's as simple as walking up to the device and then now saying my meetings and files and I click sign in on the device and the device will list, <coughs> excuse me, the device will essentially list all the users that are scheduled to be in this meeting or this session or this class at this time, right? So I actually see my name on this list. I think of it a lot like Avis Preferred where you don't have to stop at the uh, counter to get your car. You just go straight to your car. They already know you're coming. Your name is on the list. Your name is on the board. So it's kind of like that. So in this case, I'm gonna pretend to be this person called Jane Demo, and I'll just show you what this experience looks like so that we show how fast I could get to some of my own data through the cloud. And I particularly do not want to type in any passwords on this screen. In fact, I don't wanna type anything on the screen in order to sign into the Surface Hub. So I'm gonna use my phone in order to do that. So here I've come in and type in Jane Demo and I hit continue. And then the next thing it says is send notification. That's because Jane Demo's account is set up as a multi-factored authenticated user, which just means use Jane Demo's phone. So I'm gonna come in and I see on Jane Demo's phone and I'll get a little closer. There are three numbers on the screen and there's one number on the Surface Hub. I match the number 91 and then it asks me to use my fingerprint for authentication. This is all using the Microsoft Authenticator app and now it logs me into the Surface Hub so that I can now actually get to all of my 
Word, PowerPoint, Excel file, Power BI, OneDrive, Whiteboard, all these applications that are supported by a technology that we call in Microsoft single sign-on. Single sign-on means that I only sign in once and now any other application I log into or open up from now on gets to my data. So let me give you an example of that. So I'm gonna come into, in this particular case, the Microsoft Whiteboard. So I hit the uh, start button, I hit the whiteboard, and it'll actually now log me in to that whiteboard. So, whoop, interesting. Um, I'm going to come in and see if it logged me in. That's one of the first times I've ever experienced this. It did not log me into the whiteboard. And so let me come out and actually hit continue and it'll sign me in. There it goes. So now it signed me into the whiteboard. I didn't have to um, type in any passwords or prompts. It just automatically signed me straight in. Uh, the one that I want to open is this particular one. And so I could actually open up a whiteboard that um, I'm pulling down from the cloud. And this is a, a whiteboard that I had already pre-made, right? Now, the value of the whiteboard is this whiteboard runs on every Windows 10 device, all 1 billion devices that are out there. So you can go to the Microsoft Store, type in whiteboard. This will be the first one that shows up. And this is a collaborative whiteboard, meaning that it can you can co-author or share or do collaboration with this whiteboard with your coworkers. In this case, I also have a iPhone. And what's cool about the whiteboard is the whiteboard runs on the iPhone as well. So here I have an iPhone and I can actually come into this iPhone, open up the whiteboard, and I will actually see this same whiteboard that I have on the screen. And I have a different user on this account than I say have on this account, but I'm able to actually collaborate across these devices. Now, even though these devices are just inches apart and I'm not using Miracast or any kind of sharing technology, I'm literally connected by a data center. And the data center for me is probably hundreds of miles from me. But what the value is, is I could come in and say, hey, I want to write in uh, hello on this screen. It's an interesting choice of ink. Um, but in this case, now I typed in hello for my iPhone and it showed up on the screen. And thanks to the speed of light and the data center transmission, I'm able to now collaborate across these two devices, um, which are, again, inches apart, but their data paths are probably hundreds of miles apart. And so there's a cool feature within the whiteboard that allows me to actually grab the ink off of here. So I could actually grab this and turn it into OCR recognizable text and be able to pull that in. But another piece could be is, hey, sometimes I might want to add some other type of uh, content. And so maybe I actually want to add a X-ray in this point that I maybe was a physician and I have my phone and I took a picture of an X-ray and I want to be able to share it with some other people from a digital, from a uh, telemedicine standpoint. So here I added this, uh, this X-ray from the actual iPhone, but now I can come in and actually say, hey, you know, we may have a uh, fracture you know, right here or something. I am not a physician, so I'm just pretending right now to know what I'm talking about, which I have no idea. But in this particular case, I can now analyze and work across the device with other physicians, other nursing staff, other clinical people in order to determine what the problem is with this particular patient's hands. Um, so, so not only can I do that, but I have that ability. Now, I could simply also just join a meeting, say that I've maybe I've done some collaboration with the people around me, but on the Surface Hub, that allows me to essentially jo join a meeting, and I can actually do that very simply as well by just tapping and joining the meeting. Now, I want to show you that actually on the 85, um, but before I do, I want to finish by showing that not always are people able to join a meeting that are, uh, you know, during a scheduled time. And so this collaboration that took place, maybe I wanna share this with some other colleagues that are part of my team. And so one of the things that I can do within the whiteboard is actually share this whiteboard to Teams. And so I could say post to Teams and the device will actually come in and say, hey, um, post it to the one team that you're a member of here. Usually if you have Teams, you're a member of a lot of Teams. Um, but in this case, I'm gonna post it to the one team that Jane Demo is a member of. And now that means that if another physician or a clinical person was a, was a member of this team, they can now see this um, in the team's area as well. And so let's go ahead and show what that looks like because I'll close out the whiteboard and actually go into, um, go into uh, the Edge browser and then type in teams.microsoft.com. 
www.thepeopleshow.com. And now it doesn't just go to the team's landing page as we talk about, it actually goes into Jane Demo's team's environment. Whoops, there, there it goes. And so now I hit use the web app and now it'll actually pull up Jane Demo's team's environment. So I can look in all the different teams. I can look in the calendar. I can go ahead and see anything else that's coming up. But one in particular is here's a link within the team that she posted to that if I hit link here, it will actually pull up now that actual whiteboard. So I go ahead and hit it and then it'll pull up that whiteboard that we were just a member and just did all that collaboration on. So it's kind of a cool flow that kind of works towards that, that I could log into the device very simply with my phone without any password authentication of having to type anything in. I can um, easily collaborate with all my colleagues that are a member of my team through Teams and be able to share that content with them as well. And we could have even recorded this session so we had an audio track and a video track as well as even a transcription of our conversation to all take place um, and saved within teams as well as the collaborative session that we actually had um, towards that so pretty cool technology um, the other thing would be is at the end of the session i can actually hit end session and be able to walk away with confidence knowing that i didn't leave any content on the device it actually just erases everything straight off of the device and the device is ready for the next group of people to walk in and use it just like i did now this device is a little special it actually has a battery on it and so i'm going to actually move my microphone that i'm talking to you across and be able to show you that here is my AC connection. So I have my AC connection right here. I'm going to disconnect my AC power from the device and I can actually just loop this straight over the device and you'll see that if I was to come and make my camera view a little larger at this point, you'll see that I could actually now take the device for a walk um, and be able to move it around from space to space. So there's literally no cables attached to this device at this point. It still has all the functionality it had before because it's a wireless device connected through Wi-Fi into, in this case, my home Wi-Fi, but it could be throughout the hospital or the, or the cl clinician or any other space um, within the research environment that we want to have this device. So we could roll it into nursing stations. We could roll it into patients' rooms. We could roll it from conference room to conference room without losing any of this content and without being able to have, um, you know, the, the ability to have to restart. Uh, the other piece would be is we can turn in, the, in this case any space into a collaborative workspace because now we have this ability just to light up this environment by rolling this in. We have camera, speaker, microphone. We can reach out and um, work with anybody else that's connected via Teams and be able to work across the globe um, from this single station that is now powered by battery. The battery lasts about 100 minutes. Um, so that's almost two hours to say um, towards being able to use the battery in different environments and then just plugging the battery the device back in just starts charging the battery again so with that i will move the device back to its holding area and i'll show you something that's uh, cool about the 85 inch so let me go ahead and hopefully come to my preset for the 85 inch that i have Let's see, hopefully that is working. All right, so here's our 85 inch Surface Hub. Um, this device, as we said, uh, is still in development. Um, it will release before the end of this calendar year. Um, so, and we'll start shipping it before that time. That's about as much detail as I can give you right now about the device, but know that it is beautiful in its uh, structure. It's very similar to the 50 inch device in its form, fit and finish. Um, so in, in being able to have a device like this, where literally it turns any meeting space or any kind of presentation space into a collaborative workspace as well. So one thing that I wanna show you is how easy it is to actually call somebody or join a meeting. Now I'm gonna do a little bit more of an ad hoc meeting and actually call my coworker Alfred from this device right now. So, and then I wanna to present to him this particular content because you can imagine from a, from a standpoint of uh, being able to use this as a teaching device where maybe we're talking about the, the heart um, and the cardiovascular system, or maybe we're talking about x-rays and being able to analyze you know, some point on them that needs to be diagnosed. Um, we can use this, to, this device for all those different types of tools, but we could also use it to do remote learning or even telemedicine in some cases to be able to talk to patients through the device. So here I'm gonna walk up to the device. I'm gonna hit the start button. I'm gonna hit um, home and go into uh, Teams. 
that opens up a panel on the side. I'm going to do what's called meet now, and I'm actually going to invite Alfred to this call. So I'm going to say A L O. Oh, let's see. J U. There he is. So there's Alfred, and I'm going to actually start the meeting and see if he joins the meeting so I can talk to him. So we'll see if this works. <laughs> We're live. And there's Alfred. He joined the call. So let me go ahead and uh, actually see if we can get some speaker volume from him. And maybe Alfred, if you could turn on your uh, camera, that'd be awesome. And I think I can hear you. There you are. There you are. So at this point, I'm going to actually show how big can we make Alfred on the screen. So there's Alfred in a full a 4K um, 50 or 85 inch display. And now I can actually share um, and do actually almost like a telemedicine session here with Alfred by being able to pull him straight in. Now he could have joined a scheduled meeting, but in this case we did an ad hoc where maybe I'm a physician and I want to reach out to one of my um, patients and now I'm able to talk to Alfred. And so when we're actually interacting with each other, we look almost, well, Alfred's even a lot bigger than I am right now, but one of the things that I could do is I could actually make Alfred a bit smaller um, and make him uh, come to the side of the screen. But the other thing I could do is I could actually share this content with Alfred and be able to present this to him as well so he could see it as well. So I have the ability to share the content when it puts a yellow bar around it. But one of the cool things I actually want to show you is how from this device, Alfred and I could actually do a whiteboarding session as well. And so within here, if Alfred's ready for this, I'm going to uh, join a whiteboard and then invite him to the actual whiteboard itself. So hopefully I didn't. Uh, we'll see if uh, our demo gremlins are are on our side here, but we will uh, go ahead and uh, I'm going to try to do that one more time. Um, again, we're working on this device, the 85 inch that is still in um, still going through its production pieces. And so we'll see if this actually works. But one of the things that I could do is I could actually dynamically add Alfred to this whiteboard session and then he could join it, add contents. You know, we could go back and forth towards how he's feeling. Maybe he's go through his, what his diet chart is or something else along that line. And then we're able to bring that in. Well, right now my whiteboard is not cooperating with me quite so well, but the other things that I could do, we could, we could talk to Alfred about Again, we could talk to him about maybe how his surgery went and how he's healing within the x-ray pieces, but also other pieces. So hopefully you can kind of see this particular piece and how the workflow can actually work with a device like this and how you can walk up to the device, use it, join meetings and be able to collaborate, but also talk to patients or do telemedicine through a device like this or through a 50 inch device that can easily roll from space to space. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you, Alfred, for joining. We will uh, hang up from the call at this point and we will come back and uh, come back to this uh, main camera and say, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to uh, attend this particular webcast. And I will be happy to answer any questions in the panel or other pieces around Surface Hub. The other piece that I would say is if you have interest in doing a deeper dive and we can actually do some non-disclosure um, conversations around the 85 inch Surface Hub, then I'd be happy to. If you want to reach out to your um, Surface specialist or your Microsoft representative, they can put you in touch with how we can actually do a dedicated session and do more of a deep dive around this for your particular needs. Uh, we have a lot of healthcare customers that are adopting Surface Hub and we'd be more than happy to talk about those use cases that you're using it as well. So with that, I'll turn it back to the um, panel and Sam and be able to uh, keep moving. Frank, thank you so much. That was super informative. As always, uh, anyone would have thought you've demoed that before. It's uh, really <laughs> slick, really good. Thanks. So yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I think we're moving on nicely with time here. Uh, so we'll progress with our uh, customer panel. So I think we've got all of our panel members on board. I've got Anthony Kay from Beckton Dickinson, and I have got Jeremiah Brown and David Switz with us from MVP Healthcare. So all three of these uh, clients are, are in the healthcare sector and they are all three clients of Kinley, Pexit and Microsoft. So there's good fits all the way along the line. So gentlemen, thank you very much for joining. How are you all? Doing good. Thanks, Ali. 
Good stuff. Thank you. Do you guys want to do some quick intros? Tell people a little about yourself. That would be great. Thanks. Start with uh, Jeremiah. Sure. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Brown. I work at MVP Healthcare. Um, I lead their cloud services Microsoft technology team. I uh, work very closely with uh, Kinley and Microsoft to uh, roll out Teams to our customers. It's been a great experience so far. Good stuff. Thank you. David? I'm David Switz. I'm a senior leader at MVP Healthcare. We're a small payer. Um, not relative, well, relatively small, $3 billion in uh, mostly New York and Vermont. And um, we've adopted Teams, Kinley, and Pexip. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm excited to, to be here. And I want to thank everyone um, from those three organizations for having both Jeremiah and I here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, Anthony, how are you? Good. Yeah, yeah. my name is Anthony Kay. I, I work for BD or Beckton Dickinson, as some may know it. Uh, very large uh, health uh, device provider. I guess I could go on and on about the different products, but uh, I, uh, I, I oversee all of our video collaboration. So conference rooms, um, more so now with Teams. I've been pulled into the Teams environment or the Teams team. Um, been in this space for about you know 15 17 now 17 years now losing track of time um so looking forward to talking pexip and talking some of the other teams room great stuff okay so we'll kick off really with a, a very open question uh to all of you you know i think anthony will ask you first what prompted bet and dickinson's move to teams um you know what what were the key driving factors behind that move um i we were a Skype for business shop for a lot of years. Um, I was part of the team that was really um, meant to remediate some of the challenges that we were facing with Skype for business, particularly with our external customers, nurses, hospitals, those types of things um, that faced a lot of challenges with Skype for business. So I would say what prompted it Well, I mean, you know, how we inter interact with our external customers and how we uh, collaborate, you know, with them really was a challenge with Skype and Teams, uh, you know, was something that would change the, the face of how that would work just from its ground up infrastructure, how it was built, you know, it wasn't acquired like Skype for Business and how it, it uh, we, we could see that it was a true Microsoft, you know, adopted product, so. Yeah, great. And and David, really, what was, what was, the, what was the key factors behind you guys moving in a Teams direction? So you really have to break Teams up into two separate pieces. Teams as a as a unified collaboration platform, and Teams as basically an IM platform. Um, when you go back in history with with MVP, they were a huge Tanberg shop, so it was a closed communication. And we were also um, right before Jeremiah and I got there, a Skype for Business organization. And at that time, we really um, you know weren't. The, the the team's WebEx conversation was really WebEx was the winner because there, yeah. really, there really was no teams at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So we went down the path and built out all this WebEx infrastructure and with WebEx room kits and endpoints and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but knowing that Microsoft is, is our long-term partner, our CIO has said, Microsoft is where we want to be. So we were carefully watching the, the team's the Skype to Business and Teams evolution. And when when, when you follow that, what we did um, was we started to look at Teams as a replacement for um, just instant messaging, simply yeah. instant messaging. But with the the adoption of co you know the COVID situation of what occurred during COVID, it yeah. was a game changer. And and really the movement to teams and we can talk about it you know as we go on um was driven by by covid mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. of the need to be able to communicate quickly efficiently and easily because as many people know senior executives aren't really overly technical and and they yeah. they want things to be simple and straightforward so for us this whole covid movement um was was a big driver for us so on, on the covid note uh you know maybe jeremiah you can help me with this are you, have MVP arrived to the strategy of what you're doing for people returning to the office? Is it still completely on ice? You know, what, what are you guys talking about on that front? Well, that's, that's a that's a good question. I know uh, Dave is over there smiling because we just started bringing people back into the office um, yeah. last week and this week. 
Well, I think what I've found, at least on my team, is we're geographically separated, and Teams has allowed us to work more collaboratively as a team than when mm -hmm. we're in the office. Instead of having the water cooler talk and conversations in the hall with people, now we're able to really come together as a team, and we've just been working so much better together that I know in our IT organization, at least, Dave and our other leaders have basically said, IT doesn't really even need to be in the office for the most part. Outside yeah. of your desktop support and stuff like that, the majority of us are working much more collaboratively, more productively at home using Teams than we ever were in the office. Okay, great. And Anthony, from a you know MVP's a, a big player here in the in the US, but BD truly has a, a global footprint. Are you finding that that Teams is helping certain offices around the globe come back into the workplace while others are still remote? Is is that something that's the Teams has made simpler, or, or is no one, in fact, back in the office yet globally? Yeah, I mean, you know, different regions obviously are being allowed to come back in, and <laughs> those are being retracted. Like in Belgium, they were allowed to come back in, and now that they've loosened some of the things, now they're like, oh, no, we're locking everything down again. But, you know, going back to kind of what David was talking about, you know, the migration to Teams, our, our plan really was derived before COVID hit. And once COVID hit, we accelerated the plan by many months. And we were going for a big bang effect. We were going to migrate all 60,000 users over one weekend originally. And what, from an international perspective, what drove our migration of, you know, first was our Asia PAC offices. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. they were the most hard hit, you know, were more visible originally. And so that was the region that went before everybody else. Um, and that, that to me, you know, working with those groups, um, they're a little further along than even some people are in, in how they use Teams because they adopted it, you know, even several weeks earlier than everybody else. So it definitely has played a role in, in how we interact globally. Um, and people are coming to the realization that, you know, you know, just Jeremiah said that we can work, things can get done remotely with Teams and, and, and so yeah. it doesn't matter globally, you know, geographically where you really are. So perfect, perfect. Now, David, you, uh, you and Anthony uh, and Jeremiah, all three organize, all two organizations, and three people on the call adopted Pexit. Where did you, uh, you know, I remember when I first had that conversation with you about Pexit, and uh, you know, you were you were blown away. You went straight on the website, all the Gartner reviews. How do you feel Pexip's been key in adopting your team strategy or, or where were you and where, did, where do you want to get to and how has Pexip enabled that? Right, so I think back to the, the separation of teams as IM versus teams as a UC. So if you go back in time, we, we moved from a Tamburg infrastructure to a WebEx RoomKit infrastructure, but now comes teams. And, and you'll recall Jeremiah and I sitting there, you know, kind of scratching our head going, man, we've got these WebEx endpoints. I've got a DX80 that I'm running this thing off of today. Yeah, you know, I'm running a Teams meeting today off of DX80. So, you know, here I am scratching my head six months ago trying to figure out how I'm going to integrate Teams into all these beautiful rooms that um, that we just recently built out with all these Cisco endpoints. And that's when Microsoft, you know, Alfred came to both Jeremiah and I and said, you got to get in touch with Kinley and, and, and they'll bring in Pepsi and Pexip. And, and that's when we met you, Alvar. And, and what you showed me, my, my, my jaw dropped. And we saw much of that today. And, and I'll kind of turn it over to Jeremiah because the implementation of moving to a Teams with a Cisco endpoint infrastructure with a Pexip cloud support you would think would be super complicated because there's a lot of touch points, but you know, Jeremiah, why don't you talk just briefly about what that implementation looked like? We had three different locations across New York in about 60 different rooms. So with that. Yeah, we, as Dave said, we had, you know, multiple locations, uh, 60 rooms, but we also had users such as Dave working from home with these uh, DX80 endpoints. Um, we worked with Kinley and Pexip and we had all, everything stood up in less than a week. I think it was one day per site, if that. Um, they came on, helped us out, and we were able to, my team of like five guys was able to completely change these buildings in a matter of hours. And yeah. I know it took a lot longer than that when we put, put WebEx in initially. So it, it was really, uh, really impressive. 
Right. So you take that now to the end user. And the reason of the adoption with Teams over WebEx is just its ease of use. And as as was pointed out earlier in the morning where, you know, I have integration to Office, I have integration to files, I have integration to all the things that I do in my day to day life right at my fingertips at Teams. And if I want to reach out and talk to somebody, I push a button. I don't have to switch over to a different application. I don't have to find the WebEx, do the meet now and do all that stuff. WebEx is a great product, don't get me wrong. But if you are a Microsoft shop and you've got Microsoft Outlook and Office and all those pieces and parts in 365 and Teams is your direction, then Pexip and it is the piece that's missing for uh, for you as an organization to be able to make that connection. And I have senior executives now saying, man, this is so much more um, user friendly. It's so much more intuitive and it's so much easier for me to be able to meet with with staff and, and have you know meetings on a collective basis. I mean, it really is a game changer and, I, and I'm not doing that from a sales pitch. I'm not yeah. getting paid. You know, I just it has been um, a, a, a radical change in meetings for our organization. I think the key really, David, was the very detailed demo that I gave you. Which, uh, <laughs> Andrew, you would have laughed when David was asking, well, what is it? How does it work? I said, take me to a Cisco room and I'll put you on a team's call. And it was it was that easy, though, right? And, it, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a two minute thing. But and the beauty was, of it, not to interrupt you, but the beauty of it was there was no reinvestment in the endpoints. So to yeah. your point earlier, I don't have to throw out $150,000, $250,000 in endpoints and replace it with something new. I was able to use the same endpoints that I had just purchased within the last 18 months and run them through the depreciation cycle and leverage them in this environment. Yeah. Game yeah. It's, a, it's an absolutely valid point. No, no, one, no one has the budget to put new Hit into the bin, into the trash. Sorry, and uh, yeah, that, that that's an excellent point. So again, both companies here have got Surface Hub and they've got MTR. Anthony, can you uh, talk me through some of your decision or, or key decision making between where uh, MTR or where have, where has requests come from Surface Hub in the organisation and where you feel MTR resides better? Yeah, I think. Uh... You know, back in November, it you know when this was all announced at the Microsoft's event, you know, around the the MT. I mean, we previously had the the link room systems or Skype room systems, depending on what you want to call them, um, and they just were you know, technical term a train wreck. Um, we we couldn't get those things out the door quick enough. So when they made this you know announcement with the MTR, I really looked at it as a way to get away from you know, these heavy lifting video conference rooms where we've got, you know, Crestron integrating with the video conferencing. And, you know, at that time, Cisco wasn't really doing a lot of enhanced room control with their touch panels like they have started to do. But, um, you know, it's really how I looked at it as a way to, you know, look at these plug and play devices that were going to live in our Office 365 ecosystem. They were going to live within Teams. Um, and really drive some different experiences for for our end users. And yeah. so I really just, I think from a, an adoption perspective, you know, the MTR's long-term vision, I guess, the MTR's really are going to alleviate a lot of our, our headaches when it comes to deployment. And, and from an easy use perspective, you know, the experience is the same at my desktop as, as, it, as it is in the conference room, which, even with interop like Pexip or Poly like we use today, we're moving to Pexip by the way. So uh, the the interop experience is great, but the MTR kind of takes it just to that next level. And I'll give you a recent example with one of our board members was as they were using their boardroom with the Cisco, and they said, "I want to raise my hand. I, I want to raise my hand from the Cisco." And you can't do that. You can't raise yeah. your hand. And this is a little tiny thing, right? But they're so used to working from home with teams and having all of that, that they go into that interop piece. And it's just one of those little tiny things. Um, but frankly, I don't, I don't believe we'll get away from Cisco in these big auditoriums or these really big spaces, but maybe perhaps into the, in these, uh, um, you know, boardrooms will we'll slowly get there. Yeah. David, you're also a, a, a Surface of user, uh, where do you see 
Have you got specific use cases in your healthcare organization for service health? Yeah, we do. And, and the, the, this again gets into the differences between the integration with Office 365 and the component pieces of Office 365 and, um, you know, the, the standalone effect of maybe a, a WebEx room kit. Um, again, Microsoft Shop, Team Shop, um, but we're also agile. So mm -hmm. as an agile organization, there are tons of scrum meetings. There are ton, tons of whiteboard sessions. There are a lot of you know design and architecture conversations occurring. So as we built out huddle rooms, we built out huddle rooms with Surface Hub specifically for those agile teams and those scrum meetings where they could use the whiteboard features, save the whiteboard features, import the whiteboard features, bring them into the team's conversation uh -huh. and then have them yeah. into perpetuity. So from a design standpoint, what we found was that, you know, WebEx was good because it brought the collaboration together, but teams took it to the next step where we could actually do whiteboard sessions. And the beauty of that for people who haven't gone down that path is you can actually turn over control of that whiteboard from one location to another location so that they can start to edit and do things, um, you know, in a, in a very iterative fashion. Yeah, no, I. I see that and it's interesting. Clients come to me a lot with, uh, you know, oh, we'd like to use uh, MTR for this. And, and can we whiteboard? Yes, you can whiteboard, but it's interesting to educate people. It's, it's all about the use case for me. It's what is that room, that department, that team necessarily using it for? If it's presentation only, you know, MTR is possibly a better way to go uh, with teams. Uh, but if there's interactivity needed, then whiteboard, uh, and Surface Hub becomes a key. During your rollout, Anthony, was there, did you find uh, sectors of your organization during your team's rollout that were pushing back? And if there was any pushback or justifications to be made, what what did you, how did you overcome that? Or, or, or what was your reasoning? I mean, to be transparent, you know, I wasn't the team leader for the project, I was part of the team, but I was seeing a lot of the, the conversation and and going back to the experiences we had when we migrated from same time, Lotus same time over to Skype for business, <laughs> uh, you know, that transition was was rough uh, mm -hmm. because we did, just like David was talking about, we were just looking at it from a chat perspective, right? In a meetings perspective, we weren't using, you know, Enterprise Voice or anything with it really. And so, you know, when, when we were looking to move the teams, yeah, of course there was, a lot of people were like, oh, great, here's the next big thing. IT's like, you know, hey, this is going to be be awesome. And the first wasn't planned, but the first group of pilot users were some pretty high level executives. And once they got their hands on it, it it was like a wildfire. And that's when they they came and said, you know, how quickly can you do this? How quickly? And it was like, OK, well, let's we can do this over a weekend. Let's start planning. So, you know, from a from a pushback of an end user, I, I don't, I think initially there was that, you know, it's something new like anything else, but in short order, once people, and, and then the timing of it really, you know, COVID hit and people were really forced into this mode of, I got to do video for my desktop now, I've got to remotely do these meetings, I have to figure out how to make this work. Um, and, and also this time with training and education, we got it right. You know, a yeah. shameless plug for a company called Brainstorm. I mean, mm -hmm. fantastic. Like, you know, these little quick two minute modules, not these long training videos, these little two minute modules of how do I do this? How do I do that? Really drove down that noise and got people away from the, you know, wanting to, tr you know, use WebEx. And because we were, we do have WebEx users. So, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's an interesting point. And, uh, you know, what, what boggles me or amazes me, we've got a couple of, uh, Fortune 100 accounts, and you're saying people are, are WebEx users or Teams users, or and they're like, uh, yeah, we've got 600,000 Microsoft licenses all using Teams, but we had we had 25,000 Zoom users come through the back door during COVID. I'm like, how does that even happen? You know, 25,000, isn't it, slip through the back door? But you know, the the multi environment, the, the different users, and some of these organisations are so large that they become factionalised and some department somewhere else will try and ad hoc do something. So that's a real interesting point. Jeremiah, what was your, um, what, what do you think so far in your integration has been the biggest hiccup or speed bump that you found? Or has it been relatively painless? 
It, it's been relatively painless. We, we got really lucky. Our, our governance team did a lot of white glove for a lot of the more difficult users, and they did a great job of that. But um, one of the things that I know I've, Dave and I have talked about is, you know, the adoption has been fantastic. A lot of people have just been able to pick it up and go with it. There hasn't really been a need to do a lot of in-depth training for some of this. Um, it's It's been great. Yeah, we were fortunate, uh, Oliver. Two events happened. COVID, mm -hmm. COVID, and then about seven days later, WebEx failed miserably. Right. Okay. And, and when WebEx failed, tell me, tell me what really happened, David. I was, I was <laughs> quite sure. <laughs> so as WebEx had difficulties connecting, people yeah. took it upon themselves to say, "Hey, let me try Teams." Yeah. And with that just it, this whole domino effect started to happen where wow this is easier wow you know the connection's better the picture's better it's so intuitive but and and so on so yeah. you know it, they say timing is everything and i think timing was a it's big true. Thing. it's like the perfect storm um and you all you, you know you and i are working closely together on, on several different deployments uh if you had to to give your say top one or two tips for for what if you could have gone back a year and told you, yourself a year ago, what, what would you have done or what, what would have smoothed the process a little bit? What would your two best bits of advice be to getting onto the Teams platform? Um, I, I think I think the user adoption part, you know, Jeremiah, you hit on it, like going after those like noisemakers, those those complainers, I guess you could say, or, or just the technically challenged folks. I mean, I think with you know, even though I look back, you're saying look back, what would I do different? I mean, I think this time we did it different. This time we 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 talked to a company like Brainstorm and we really put something in front of people that they could hit, you know, hit from a web page and, and learn how to do the, the simplest things. Join a meeting. How do I mute people? How do I, you know, those types of things? Because honestly, that was the stuff that was creating the most noise in the Skype for business side of things is, you know, not being able to see some of that stuff. So, you know, Training, education, adoption, user adoption. I think the implementation side is such a small piece of that. It's really just prepping people. We didn't have a lot of time to do that. Obviously, none of us did with COVID, right? But but I think you know identifying those those targeted users that you have to really you know hold their hand and then create some yeah. user adoption plan. So yeah, and I think to that to that point, I think that's a great point, Anthony, is that what our um, governance team actually did was we created a, um, a channel for help. And there's a whole lot of people who monitor that channel and people have, you know, they feel free to say, hey, you know, I don't know how to how to mute my, my microphone or I don't, you know, they'll ask a how to question. And while we've got a whole bunch of information out on the website, there's a whole bunch of people that are monitoring that channel that are giving them instantaneous information on how to's and, and yeah. tips and tricks and that I was never a big sorry go ahead David. no that, i think that's helped a lot i was never really a big yammer person but that's what we leveraged was yammer and nice. exactly what you said you know an open line in communication people post a question we had different we had different champions throughout the company teams champions that just sat there and watched that watched for questions based on the regions and you know got back to people right away and that made a huge difference people didn't feel abandoned yeah so, we'll have to try that. that's a good idea i like that yeah that's really smart i like that a lot as well it, it's just an overriding message that's coming through from this you know it's adoption 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 and that's why the you know i know microsoft when i speak to people like sam who's producing the call today you know she she's high on the, the user adoption piece and uh, you know, Alfred makes sure that, that people are, are really able to use all the feature sets at the surface of them. You know, clients that we have, um, should we say, uh, the clients that are the most satisfied are the people that concentrate on the adoption side of things. The clients that are the least satisfied uh, and seem to get angry almost at themselves are those who just purchase something as a box sale. Uh, and expect a service hub just to suddenly work wonders in the corner and why is that no one's really using it because everyone's a bit scared of it and if no one knows why or what the use case is or how to go about that then you know those issues will will really arise so a tip of the hat to all of you for identifying that um as we start to come to the end of things a bit of an open question 
anything you'd like to see or, or anything, you know, someone mentioned before, uh, Anthony, I think you mentioned before, you'd like to see the raise hand feature maybe appear in Pexip or something, you know, which is something Andrew, I'm sure, can take back. Anything else anyone would like to see in terms of interop or, or pieces, any piece along the chain from Teams? Hmm. I'll put you on the spot a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's what I'm here to do. <laughs> I, I think for 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 us, the you know Teams is ever evolving. The big thing that bothered me was that it was all consuming of the desktop space, and mm -hmm. now they've created the ability to pop out chats and do different things. So it's constantly evolving, and you can you can put some of um you know your thoughts into that going forward. Um, I think from a PEX perspective, the more we can get the actual endpoint to act. You know where I could maybe blur the backgrounds and things of those nature, things of that nature. I, I think that becomes, um, you know, more friendly and more consistent with the team's experience. Um, I, I just I think Teams has has become a very powerful tool and it is not one to be underestimated in the organization. And I th I know from it, it's interesting and I, and I haven't really told a whole lot of people this story, but right right after WebEx kind of blew up and and Teams took off. Our CEO started to look at Zoom, and I'm like, "Oh my God, don't do that!" Right? Yeah. But he's the CEO. Wow, I can't yeah. really stop him, you know. And it was interesting, you could do, but it might end badly for you. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> um, but what was interesting was it goes back to the the tool set of Teams, and that he after he evaluated it, he went through it. He goes, "You know what? Teams is far easier and more intuitive." Mm -hmm. And so the, the, that kind of put the Zoom conversation to bed. But I think, you know, the, the challenges I'm having with Teams are more external where the, the, the adoption is internal, but hey, I still need to use WebEx to reach externally to my customers or to my constituents or to my membership. And it's like, no, you don't. You can use Teams just like you could use WebEx. They can access it through a web interface. So I think you know the the traction and the the line that you posted oliver i thought was really telling is you know the investment that microsoft is making to displace zoom and take over market share i think you know will go a long way because that's really where i'm kind of struggling now is not internal it's people internal thinking they need to use something else external and that's yeah. not necessarily the case yeah no i'd agree with that i agree with that and, and that's certainly where exit help things out uh on, on that front. I think one of the, something that I hear on the grapevine, and this is probably out to the, to the Microsoft guys, is uh, interesting to hear your feedback on it. On the desktop, I, I hear the odd complaint that Teams is resource inefficient. So Teams is quite heavy on resources on the desktop. And I know that because a lot of my users inside my organization, not with clients, but a lot of my team within the organization, are like, it's quite heavy on the resource so it'd be interesting to see if microsoft can manage to make it this is far past my knowledge base but more efficient in its processing or that's I a tactful way of putting it oliver resource sorry hand. that's a tactful way of putting it resource it hand. is it is and, and but, i think i think the one thing to you know as it relates to to the resource usage on a pc the, it makes a very good argument for mtrs when it comes to teams rooms yes a lot of people want to get a camera camera bar and a puck and they want to bring their laptop into the meeting room and yeah. not do an MTR and just run it off their PC. But that is something that like in, in our company that I'm pushing back on heavily is, yeah, I understand that's the cheap, you know, cheap solution. But at the end of the day, the experience, the user experience is not going to be good. Right. Um, so I, yeah, that, it's a great, great consideration when you're looking at PC performance and, and things like that, you're not going to overcome. And, and to that end, the, the one piece as I think about it now that I would like to see um, evolve maybe a little bit faster is Windows Virtual Desktop. So I don't know if any of the audience or anybody on the on the call here is starting to go down that path. Jeremiah's team has gone heavily into Windows Virtual Desktop and we've got it rolled out to you know a couple hundred people and, and folks are using it pretty regularly. But there is a disconnect between you know the video capabilities and Windows Virtual Desktop isn't quite there yet. There's a lot of you know pass through sound issues that that are problematic. So for me it's it's trying to get that piece because our long term vision is to get rid of the desktop and, and basically have everybody and Alfred will probably be smiling if you could see his face going to Surface Go 2s. 
as the primary desktop for the majority of our staff, leveraging yeah. those virtual desktop over the top of that. Great, nice. Um, Sam, have we got any questions uh, that have come from the panel or anyone? Uh, sorry, not the panel, the, the yeah. audience? Yeah, thanks. We do have some questions coming in. The first one is actually specifically for anyone on the customer panel. So how do each of you see things changing in terms of teams, in terms of AV and conferencing as we move from remote work to this perhaps post-COVID state for your organization? What are the big changes that you foresee? I, it, at VD, I still feel like there's still a plan to come back, right? Uh, there's a lot of teams that work, you know, the value of that face to face. I think it was talked about earlier on the presentation where we've gone from these big conference rooms to more of these smaller, you know, two to three person, you know, meeting rooms because of COVID. I, I could see that how that's going to evolve our organization where we take these big rooms and chop them into three smaller rooms and people collaborate that way. Um, but it's it's definitely something in our company that a lot of people are asking is why are we investing money in conference rooms? We may not even need these conference rooms, and you know. But then I also hear you know from others that they they want to come back into the office. People are trying to get back into the office, so I don't think in our company it's going to completely go away. It's just going to change the way we work. Yeah, I would I would agree with with with. Um, with yeah, the Anthony. Anthony. yeah. sorry mm -hmm. about that i'm tongue-tied i'm thinking too fast but i would agree i think we spent a significant amount of money building out those conference rooms and you know even though there's six foot um, limitations right now i think they're they will come back into use it may not be within the next six or eight months but i think it'll it'll come within the next um you know the next year as we start to move back and vaccination vaccinations start to appear but I don't. I, I think what's going to happen is that the desktop experience is what's going to take off more than the huddle room experience or the or the meeting room experience. A lot of people before COVID felt the need to be in a huddle room or be in one of these endpoint rooms to be able to have a you know a video conference. And I think what people are now realizing is, I don't necessarily need that room anymore. I can do that right at my workspace, whether that's in the office or at home. So I think that that will be a piece of change um, that we'll see going forward. Awesome, super right. insightful. Yeah, anything else you want to add? I heard someone else speaking. Uh, yeah, one Jeremy. thing I, I know that we're, we've been looking at heavily lately is security on the AV platforms. That was something that was kind of, um, you know, no one really thought about it. They checked boxes here and there. And then as the, the issue with Zoom kind of exploded, a lot of people have been re- re-looking into that. Our CISO has been asking me questions almost daily on how all of our security stuff's uh, set up for AV and making sure that, you know, X, Y, and Z boxes are checked. We have the logs we need and all that. So I know that's been top of mind for a lot of people in our organization lately. Awesome. No, this is really helpful. I know there's a lot of customers on this call um, that are going through this journey and are at, our, are at different stages. So really insightful. The next one I went ahead and put uh, you up, Andrew, because we have one coming in. We have a Cisco environment and we want to move to Teams. What would Pexip recommend? I know it can be kind of overwhelming to start that journey. So um, where would you say to start? Well, contact Kinley and Pexip and we can uh, you know, do <laughs> all these awesome demo and you'll see the magic that David saw. Um, so I, I was just going to say that. <laughs> Um, you know, you know, many a truth is said in jest, right? Um, but that is, uh, you know, the place to start. We can easily get you up and running on a trial in our cloud, and we can have the conversation. And the really key bit is, um, really, what's your environment? What are your goals? And what are you trying to achieve? Again, it's very easy to get it set up and running and be able to make the calls. But do you want to just consume from the cloud? Do you have certain requirements that um, dictate, hey, maybe it makes sense for you to host it in Azure? What are those? Maybe you want to take advantage of an express route connection these types of things. Do you have some, you know, certain specific branding needs um, because of what you're doing? So it's really that dialogue around what you want to achieve with the integration. Um, and then we can sort of target you in the sort of right way to consume the solution. Awesome. 
Uh, so in terms of, we are getting a couple questions. I know we've already mentioned the theme a lot of adoption, change management, training. So especially for, for uh, the customer panel that we have on the call, from a training perspective, how important is it to ensure that your end users understand how to use these solutions? And then how do you as an organization, what's your strategy around increasing adoption from the beginning? Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> uh, so I can't. Sorry, go ahead, Dave. I'll let you go this time. Well, one piece I would turn over to Jeremiah first because he he was heavily involved with this is that you can't just go into teams and say I'm turning up teams and I'm going to be a teams person now because you got to remember this thing comes from different directions at you. It comes from SharePoint. It comes from Teams. And so there's some structure and I'll let Jeremiah kind of talk about what we did early on to make the adoption easy because you got to do a little bit of homework up front to set the design in place and then the adoption comes. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeremiah. Yeah, we, we worked with our a lot of different teams to kind of make sure the adoption to the end user was smooth. We brought in, you know, our enterprise architects and work with them on the EA side to make sure that it the SharePoint stuff was locked down, the team stuff was locked down and the OneDrive stuff was locked down since there's pieces of all of that involved. Um, then we worked closely with our governance team on spinning up a pretty cool onboarding process. So they um, they sat down with pretty much all the users, the initial users, found uh, people who would be you know willing to be champions of teams, um, kind of got the initial use cases, and we kind of worked around that to build a really um, in-depth onboarding experience for the end user to include training that they went through, which was all done in-house. So it was people that they knew teaching them how to do all of these things. We set up throughout every week there was um, basic intermediate and advanced classes for all of our people that were being onboarded um, and the adoption based on that was great you know the the people who needed more hand holding got a white glove experience and the people who you know could figure it out on their own they just kind of went in and if they had questions they asked in the teams chat that Dave was mentioning earlier and it was just really smooth there wasn't too many major issues or anything like that and Every, like Dave said, everyone's loved it and COVID just kind of reiterated that fact that everyone was on board and the training worked and you know all of our, our, our adoption criteria was met and it was a great experience. Awesome. Anything else that anyone wants to add on that, the training piece? Okay, so we'll go to the next one. We have a couple of questions around follow-ups on devices. So um, if anyone could give us like specific use cases of using the Surface Hub versus an MTR. I, I think the the MTRs, uh, or sorry, the Surface Hubs for our, at least for our company, have really been in office spaces, uh, more niche, you know, people who like to whiteboard and draw and do things like that. Whereas the MTRs are just the, Hey, I just want to see someone and I just want to have a conversation. Now, understand that we haven't had a lot of people in the office, so we put MTRs in, but we haven't, you know, had a lot of utilization of that. But that's really what the two differences in our company is, is, you know, we don't, we don't put surface hubs in conference rooms typically. So, mm -hmm. too much training. I mean, you know, to really use a surface hub, in, in my opinion, you know, to use all the tools that like we were demoed earlier, there's some real user adoptions and training that has to happen and that's easier to do in, in a, you know, a single person's office or even a little two group, three group collaboration area where they share it. It's easier to do that, so. Awesome, thank you, super helpful. Um, we have a question, I'm gonna cue David up for this first. We have a question around, if or when you all consider that many other organizations are using more commercialized solutions for AV, how are you able to make the decision to move towards a more comprehensive solutions like Teams and PECSIP for AV? So for us, we were already WebEx, so we didn't we had not evaluated a whole lot of different platforms because that's kind of where we were going to go. You know, and it's interesting if you follow Oliver on LinkedIn, he, he published yesterday and I think today, and we talked about it earlier in the week, a whole bunch of organizations are now coming out with really cool endpoints and really cool things that 
kind of blow away, you know, the Cisco room kits. And so I think, you know, if I were going to start this over again today, I'd still want to move to teams, mm -hmm. but I would really evaluate more closely those endpoints that I select because there's so many different options. Three years ago, there really was, you know, the Crestron and the Logic, and it was like a whole bunch of mishmashes behind the scenes that you needed to have space for in a room to be able to build those endpoints, as opposed to a room kit that clipped to the bottom or the top of a piece of glass. So I think today I would look at it differently because there's lots of options, but I would still not question moving to teams. That's where I would go and then build the AV strategy around that. And that's where, you know, Kinley and, and Oliver and team would definitely help out. It's a, it's a really interesting point, you know, because there, there are, as I say, the, the markets become democratized. Every, you know, Teams, Microsoft have gone, nope, we don't want to get involved with the hardware for the MTR. And there's so many different manufacturers out there. And the real winners, it would appear from our end, because we've got to work with people like yourselves uh, in order to get a swift integration. The real winners are the companies that are making it easiest to get the, the, the MTR equipment updated and ready to go from day one. And then on from that, those that have got the best open APIs to actually manage it, you know, Anthony can seize control of a Crestron Flex MTR, for example, sat from his office at home. So he can all, that all of a sudden opens up loads of white glove opportunities if they've got very high end execs having a meeting and they just literally want someone to push the button remotely. You know, these sort of things all come into play. Uh, whereas some, uh, you know, the counter argument to that is a lot of our clients like the Lenovo ThinkPub 500 because it's frankly five to six years old and it stood the test of time in the market, but it may not have some of the benefits of the others. So what, what God giveth with one hand, you take away with the other, you know, there's a happy medium and it really does depend on what you're looking to do in your team's rooms. Awesome. And actually, Ollie, we have a question uh, specifically for you. So we have one around, can Kenley implement and manage a PECSIP instance that resides in a customer's Azure cloud? Yes, yes, and yes. So <laughs> Kinley, um, Kinley can manage, uh, well, Kinley and Pexif, I believe, I believe we're your largest global partner, Andrew, um, you know, worldwide. So we are, we work together every day. There's always conversations between people at Kinley going on with people at Pexif. So, uh, and, and, you know, I'm very proud to say as well, we've got a, a great gentleman on board, Henrik Schra, who, who is super knowledgeable and he's, he's my solutions architect. Uh, at Kinley here in the US, he's actually he's actually back over in, in Holland at the moment due to COVID. But you know, he works super close with the Pexit teams. So th th what I'm trying to say is, what should put a client's mind at rest is Kinley and Pexit are in conversation every day. What Pexit are, are evolving and what they're creating, um, Kinley is aware of, and and what our route to market Pexit is aware of. So you know, we have people Pexit people drop in the office. We must have a a weekly cadence call between leadership teams. So yeah, we, we are more than happy to manage those effective environments and, and really it's our it's our weapon of choice or as one of my good friends Marco Fassen used to say, Pexip is our Swiss army knife that allows us to get into any platform. Nice, love the partnership there. We have, th thank you so much everyone for the engaging questions. We have so many coming in. Um, we're only going to get to a certain number of them, but if you submit them, we're going to post this afterwards. I'm going to share my screen here really quickly just so you have this. Uh, we're going to post this afterwards on aka.ms slash HLS blog. That's our healthcare and life sciences blog. So there's a ton of great content here. And obviously, a lot of people couldn't make it for the whole three hours today. But if you have colleagues and, um, you know, people that you think would benefit from watching uh, portions of this, the whole event, please send them here. We'll also put up resources afterwards uh, along with the recording. So just wanted to keep you posted on that. But we do have some more questions coming in. We have a little bit of time left. Um, this one's more for Andrew and Ollie. So there are some people asking about their Skype to Teams transition. And as we all know, end of life for Skype for Business uh, um, is going to be July 2021. So 
any hints, any tips there that you would like to give to customers joining the call today around that transition? I think I'll kick off with some process stuff and hand over to Andrew for maybe what PECSIP are looking to do with that. But really, common sense prevails. It, it is coming and it'll be coming faster than you expect it. So now is the time to get to what the guys were saying on the call, get your users comfortable with Teams. Start thinking about that process. How does the training and adoption start with Teams? From a physical point of view, you should be having active conversations with companies like Kinley and Pexit. How are we going to help you migrate? You know, so it, it, it's not a it's not a simple process, but it's a process we're managing for a lot of people. And those who are having the greatest level of success, like anything, are highly organized, intuitive about this, and are and are, and are making a very uh, pragmatic approach, uh, lining all their ducks up, ready to leave no stone unturned. So. Um, yeah, on that note, Andrew, what, what's Pexip's stance on that? I would echo what you're saying. I think the key thing, right? The time is running out. Engage now. Um, you're not the first one, so you're not the guinea pig in doing this, right? So, um, as Ali mentioned, it's really about the process engaging and, and really getting started, right? We have the tools to enable this. We can show how that works. Um, it's really the getting started. Awesome. Um, we have some questions for the customer panel around just the future of your relationships with teams and what you're most excited about in your partnership. Um, but with with any any of us, Microsoft, Pexip, and Kenley on the call today, um, what kind of excites you about the future? So, I think you know the the thing for me is you know I'm an old curmudgeon old guy that's been around a long time and <laughs> a lot of vendors come in and and vars come in and and you know want to sell you a, a bill of goods and and then they're on their merry way and the thing that immediately um, you know came to mind with me with uh, Kinley and Pexip is that they're in it for the long run with us and and they were really truly a partner in the whole thing and. And that's not to discount Microsoft. Microsoft has been a huge player in our in our world at MVP, um, and it probably is the best Microsoft relationship that I've had in my entire career. Um, and and I can't say enough about the people who are on our account and work with us. And we've got a Teams guy that's assigned to us that has been instrumental in helping us. Alfred has been instrumental in helping us get this thing off the ground. And then he brings in Kinley and Pexip, which just kind of were a natural fit. And so I don't have to sit there. The best part about all this to answer the questions, I don't have to sit there and try to figure out where the heck to go. I call Oliver on the phone and go, hey, give me another one of those whiz bang demos. Where are we going? What are we doing? You know, so the relationship in the long term partnership is, I think, super valuable here. It's it's not just another vendor and bar trying to sell you, you know, a piece of piece of hardware and software. It's a long term relationship with a product that I think has a very bright future. Perfect. Good answer. I think from from my point of view, this is just the beginning. You know, Teams is growing monthly. There's a monthly update. You know, there's nothing more to add than that. Every month we're opening our Teams environments and, and, and new feature sets, new new tools are arriving. Uh, and, and to David's point, you know, Kinley is uh, at the front of this way from, from a system integrator point of view. We are putting a whole bunch of resources into it. We've got dedicated teams now working with Microsoft and we're getting ably supported by Microsoft. So, uh, you know, it's just really exciting to see where this is all, all going to go. I, I, I can just see it evolving and evolving. And I do think, and this is my unbiased point of view, because Kinley is technically an agnostic uh, provider, but nothing can touch Teams for an end-to-end -end process. So I think the future is very bright with the Teams environment. Yes, the one, the one bit I would add, uh, having been sort of in the video industry for almost 20 years now and sort of on planes all the time trying to convince people of working the way we're doing this now. So, I mean, just the, um, you know, as unfortunate as COVID is and the tragedy that it is, the transformation that we're seeing is to me super exciting, the innovation that's being driven because of this transformation and the acceptance of sort of working in new ways is, is you know, this is sort of unbounded um, where this is going to go. So pretty excited about that. Cool. Thank you, Andrew. 
the Anthony had to drop. I know he had a very important call. Um, but David and Jeremiah, really appreciate you joining us today. Um, looking forward to chatting to you more. Um, everyone in the background, Alfred, Sam, uh, you know, it's been a real team effort from Pexit, Kinley and Microsoft to get everything off the ground. Kathleen with, and Frank with great, uh, great discussion. So thanks to everyone that's joined us. Uh, we'll be doing something about the, again like this very soon. Maybe not as long. We should look to get something a little more condensed and hopefully turn it into a bit more, say, a bi-monthly cadence or something like that. So thanks everyone for your time and your support. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Week. Thanks. Okay.